it's great to see that people are concerned enough about these topics that they uh, are willing to brave the elements. I have to say that the weather does remind me of a quite major event in 1960 when I was a student at American University in their Washington semester program. I actually went to college elsewhere, but I came for one semester, and it happened to be the fall of uh, 1960. And uh, be terms lasted beyond, in longer than they do now. They lasted all the way through January. So we were stuck here in Washington, D.C. and had to find something to do on January 20th, 1961. Well, that was the, about the 19th, was it? The 19th or the 20th? No, the 19th. It was 18th and the 19th, the snow came. It was not snow like it is today. It was genuine snow. It was, it was three feet, two feet, two to three feet of snow. The whole transportation system. But for us students, it was a great opportunity. We ran over to Capitol Hill. We found representatives who hadn't given away all of the tickets to the inauguration. And I got to see Roger Frost misread his poem and I got to see Senator Kennedy give that great speech that we all read yet to this very day. Ask not what you can do for your, what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. So um, that was a great moment. So snow can be an opportunity. <laughs> it doesn't have to be a disaster. It can be an opportunity. And what we have Today is a technological resource that we didn't have in the past. We have the capacity for online streaming of an event like this. And so we hope that there is a very large audience joining us in this conversation from a distance. And welcome to all of you who are uh, watching this uh, gathering here in the uh, snowy uh, Northwest Washington. Welcome uh, to uh, our discussion of single parent families revisiting the Moynihan Report uh, 50 years later. Uh, to kick the event off, we have uh, the great good fortune of having uh, Senator Lamar Alexander with us. Uh, Senator Alexander uh, thought that perhaps he should escape Washington, but his loyalty to his commitments, his willingness to stand by uh, the promises that he has made uh, just took first priority, and he's here today. And thank you very much, Lamar, for, for joining us. Uh, now, I have followed Lamar Alexander's career, sometimes in retrospect, really rather closely, because he, in, in terms of education, he probably did, as governor, one of the most significant studies ever done. Well, he paid for it anyhow, or at least he signed the bill that paid for it. Because while he was governor, he signed the bill that allowed Tennessee to do the Tennessee Star Experiment, which was the first experimental piece of research on a large scale. And the question was, do students learn more in small classes? And this happened because Lamar as governor was not satisfied with just listening to arguments for class size or against class size. He said, well, before we do something like this on a grand scale, let's get some evidence. What's the best way to get the evidence? And so this, this study, which is constantly cited to this very day, would not have it existed but for <coughs> the leadership of Lamar Alexander. And after leaving the governor's office in 1987, he, did, uh, he served as president of the University of Tennessee. And then somewhere in that process, he actually came to Harvard to become a professor of practice. And I'm surprised that he's not still there at Harvard. I mean, that's, to me, the quintessential accomplishment of life if you can be a professor at Harvard. But no, uh, the senator decided that was a stopping point, uh, a, a place on the way to still more exciting things. And he has now been a senator from Tennessee since 2002. And he has now uh, uh, become uh, the leader of uh, one of the key Senate committees, the Senate Help Committee, 
health, education, labor, and pensions, uh, and which has a very significant um, set of policy responsibilities, uh, including the ones that are of great interest to us today. So, uh, Senator Alexander, it's really a great pleasure to see you once again and to uh, welcome you to our podium today. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, and ladies and gentlemen who are here, the snowbirds in the audience who, who brave, the, uh, brave the weather, and to any who might be, who might be uh, watching. Paul, I, I salute you for your work in education over the years, especially on giving parents more choices of schools. I was with a group last night from Ashland University, and I remembered when I went there in 1992 at the invitation of F. Clifton White. I was education secretary, and I made a speech which said, almost to the effect that by the year 2000, uh, there'd be so much school choice in America that it'd be almost a matter of history. And children would be asking their parents, when, when was this strange time when, when low-income children didn't have the same choices of schools or many of the same choices of schools that others did? So I was absolutely wrong about that, because, although we've made a lot of progress, and your leadership and scholarship has, has helped, to, helped us to do that. I first met Daniel Patrick Moynihan uh, in 1969, which was four years after he released his explosive report on the circumstances of Afri African American families in the middle of the Civil Rights era. I was 28 years old then, and by a stroke of providence had found myself sitting at a desk in the west wing of the White House next to Bryce Harlow, President Nixon's first senior staff appointment. It's the office that the vice president has today. And I sat there, right next to Mr. Harlow. My job was answering his mail, returning his phone calls, and absorbing his wisdom. We sat there and smoked cigarettes together. Uh, it was a perfect PhD in politics and government for a young man. Downstairs were two real PhDs. At one end of the hall, General Alexander Haig performed the same sort of services for Henry Kissinger that I was performing for Mr. Harlow. And at the other end of the hall was Professor Daniel Patrick Moynihan, usually with a youngster named Checker Finn camped outside his door. President Nixon had attracted these Harvard professors, Kissinger and Moynihan, to the West Wing where they joined one of the most talented and intellectually diverse teams of White House advisors of any first term president of the United States. By the way, I've always thought that if, if President Nixon had paid more attention to his wiser, more broad-gauged advisors in the White House, Harlow, Arthur Burns, Kissinger, Moynihan, and cabinet officials like Mel Laird and George Shultz, instead of the advanced men who guarded the access to the Oval Office, that there never would have been a Watergate affair. The White House was then brimming with talent. Jim Keogh, the former editor of Time, shepherded a quartet of young speechwriters, Bill Sapphire, Pat Buchanan, Lee Hebner, Ray Price, Liddy Hanford, now Elizabeth Dole, was working in the Consumer Affairs Office. And Pat Monahan himself had brought with him from Harvard four of his brightest students, Checker Finn, who might be called the nation's foremost education gadfly, the Rhodes Scholar John Price, Chris DeMuth, later head of the American Enterprise Institute, and Dick Blumenthal, now my colleague in the United States Senate. Stephen Hess, Pat's deputy in 1969, has detailed in his new book, The Professor and the President, which I recommend to you, how fascinated President Nixon was with Professor Moynihan. The professor advised the president, quote, on what books to read, to whom he should award the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and how not to redecorate the Oval Office. Moynihan persuaded Nixon to recommend the Family Assistance Plan, a negative income tax that was the forerunner of today's earned income tax credit. And looking back 50 years, that the author of such a controversial report as the one we're discussing today could have actually been hired by the President of the United States, and then later that this same author could have been elected to the United States Senate from New York three times, suggests the wiliness and the courage of this professor with a cheerful 
soul of an Irish immigrant. Let's just say Pat Moynihan followed the advice of his favorite character, Tammany Hall boss George Washington Plunkett, who said, I seen my opportunities and I took them. Today, 50 years after it was written, the trend Monaghan was detailing, the rise of households led by single mothers, has grown more dramatic and cuts across all racial groups. Today, more than four in 10 children in the United States are born outside of marriage. In 2013, the average income for households with marriage couples was more than double that of households led by women with no spouse present. Today's panelists will discuss the implications of the Monaghan Report released 50 years ago, as well as the proper policy responses. In my remarks, I will be less ambitious. I'll focus on what this trend means for the school, the most important secular institution designed to help children reach our country's goal for them, that every child, as much as possible, have the same opportunity to begin at the same starting line. And in case you want to step out for coffee at this moment, I can jump straight to my conclusion. The school can't come close to doing it all, and neither can the government. If we want our children to be at the same starting line, there must be a revival of interest in these children and their parents from traditional sources, the religious institutions, the families, and the communities of this country. To begin with, it's appropriate to ask, what is a school supposed to do anyway? Professor Coleman is often quoted as having said, James Coleman, that the purpose of the school is to help parents do what parents don't do as well. So what have our schools traditionally done that parents did not do as well? In 1988, I was at a co conference in Rochester, New York, when the president of Notre Dame, Monk Malloy, asked this question. What is the rationale for a public school? There was sort of a stunned silence all around the room until Albert Shanker, the head of the American Federation of Teachers, gave his answer. He said this, a public school is for the purpose of teaching immigrant children reading, writing, and arithmetic, and what it means to be an American, with the hope they'll go home and teach their parents. But obviously in today's world, Shanker's vision of the school doesn't come close to doing all the things that many parents are not able to do for their children. In a Washington Post story earlier this year, Sonia Romero Smith, a veteran teacher at Lou Wallace Elementary School in Albuquerque, had this to say, quote, when they first come in my door in the morning, the first thing I do is an inventory of immediate needs. Did you eat? Are you clean? A big part of my job is making them feel safe. The article was reporting that for the first time in at least 50 years, more than half of public school students are eligible for the federal program that provides free or reduced price school lunches. That means their family's income is less than 185% of the federal poverty line or below about $44,000 for a family of four. Many of them, of course, have less money than that. Romero Smith said she helps her students clean up with bathroom wipes and toothbrushes and stocks a drawer with clean socks, underwear, pants, and shoes. The job of a teacher has expanded to, she says, counselor, therapist, doctor, parent, attorney. So if parents are unable to meet the needs of these children, should the school try to meet those needs? And if the school doesn't, then who does? Well, part of the understanding to that question, uh, of the answer to that question, may come from a study last year that was not unlike the Monaghan Report in that the news it delivered was uncomfortable but important. The study came from Equality of Opportunity Project, made up of economists from Harvard and Berkeley, who looked at intergenerational mobility across areas of the United States, how likely a child from a low-income family is to make more money as an adult than their parents did. The researchers determined that we are, in fact, a collection of societies. Some of us live in what they called lands of opportunity, with high rates of upward mobility across generations. And others live in places where few children raised in low-income homes escape poverty. The researchers looked at the anonymous tax records of millions of Americans between 1980 and 1982, measuring their income in 2011 and 2012 when they were roughly 30 years old. They found five key variables that seemed to explain why some places had more upward mobility than others. The first was segregation. Areas that are more residentially segregated by race and income have 
lower levels of upward mobility. The second was income equality. The third was the quality of the K through 12 school system as measured by factors such as test scores, dropout rates. Fourth was social capital, rates of civic and religious involvement. The fifth was the strongest correlation. We found that the strongest predictor of upward mobility is the family structure, such as the fraction of single parents in the area. Quote, parents' marital status does not matter purely through its effects at the individual level. Children of married parents also have higher upward rates of mobility if they live in communities with fewer single parents, the researchers write. Put another way, if our goal is to help every child begin at the same starting line, many children raised in a single parent family have a harder time getting there. The Equality of Opportunity Project also did a second study. This one found that economic mobility has not changed much over time and is lower in the U.S. than in most developed countries. They write, for example, the probability that a child reaches the top fifth of the income distribution given parents in the bottom fifth of the income distribution is 8.4% for children born in 1971 compared with 9% for those born in 1986. In other words, the chances of moving up the economic ladder depends a lot upon who your parents are, how much money they make, and whether or not they're married. These are not easy conclusions to reach or comfortable discussions to have. But the evidence of these long odds is strong enough that our 100,000 public schools as well as our private schools should do all they reasonably can to help today's American children and their parents to succeed. First, these are, these are some ways that, that schools can help those parents succeed very briefly. Eight ideas. More parental choice for schools. The most obvious and important step the federal government can take to improve the education of children is to give their parents a broader choice of schools. We know that one of the best ways to lift a child out of poverty is give them a good education. We know that many low-income parents are seeking those opportunities and will work to get their children those opportunities. A single mom who's busy working two jobs may have a harder time getting to a parent-teacher conference, but we see in the D.C. voucher program and elsewhere that some of the fiercest advocates of school choice are single parents enrolled in the program. Researchers at the American Enterprise Institute conducted a series of focus group sessions and personal interviews with low-income urban families who were enrolled in the D.C. voucher program. They found this. Parents report they want to be respected as advocates of their child's education and will fight hard to keep their child's private school choice program if that program's future is threatened. A 2007 study published in Education Next found that parents in high poverty schools strongly value a teacher's ability to raise student achievement and appear indifferent to student satisfaction. It was parents in schools serving better off families who seemed to place less weight on academics when requesting a particular teacher for their child. A second way that schools can help challenged parents is a larger number of charter schools. That's one promising way to provide more low-income parents with school choice. In fact, one of the most exciting developments in the American education in the past two decades has been the emergence of a growing number of charter schools that have demonstrated remarkable success educating disadvantaged children. My last act as U.S. Education Secretary in 1992, after the voters had excused us from office, was to write all of the school superintendents in the country and call to their attention this new idea in the state of Minnesota called startup schools that the Democratic Farmer Labor Party had invented. Uh, those were the first 10 charter schools in the country. That was 1992. Today there are about 5,000 charter schools in America, about 5% of all of America's uh, schools are public charter schools, a remarkable change in our educational landscape. The success of these schools is attributable to many factors, from close attention to student behavior and discipline to the flexibility their teachers have to put together an excellent teaching staff. But one thing that many of them have in common is they have expanded the amount of time students spend in school, usually with longer school days. I can still see the, the school in Memphis that was only allowed to take uh, schools from schools that were failing 
and these children were there during Easter break when other children were away somewhere and they were taking advanced placement courses in their sophomore year because they were all succeeding when given the opportunity in that charter school. Low-income parents, many of them single parents, are rushing to enroll their children in these schools. I suspect one reason is school schedules that make it easier for them to make ends meet while knowing their children are well cared for. A third way the school can help challenged parents is different school schedules. It shouldn't be just charters that experiment with different schedules. School schedules that follow traditional work schedules year-round, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., would make it easier for parents to work at full-time jobs and still have the ability to be there with their child before and after school to make sure they've had breakfast in the morning, or to make sure they've done their homework in the evening. A fourth way the school can help is a flexible workplace schedule. I intend to try putting in statute authorization for employees to negotiate schedule and overtime with employees so they know how so they know so they know that they have the full support of federal law in enabling employees to find arrangements that suit their needs. Five, work site daycare. Years ago, uh, when I was in private life, I helped start a company with a fellow named Bob Keeshan, Captain Kangaroo. He and I and my wife and a guy named Brad Martin and Marguerite Salee started something called corporate child care. It was a new idea. You could take your child to work and there would be a safe place for the child. At the same time, another company in Boston was starting doing the same thing. It was called Bright Horizons. I sat next to Mitt Romney the other day at a lunch. He had funded Bright Horizons. Our company went public before theirs did. Then they combined and now it's the biggest, the biggest worksite daycare company in the, in the world, I guess. It, it, it met a real need of the greatly increased number of moms as well as dads who are working away from their home and who wanted a safe and good place for their child. That would lead to another way schools could help, which would be if we have worksite child care, why not worksite schools? A few dozen large U.S. corporations have partnered with their local school districts to open public schools in their corporate facilities. It's a similar idea to worksite daycare. It provides working parents with a choice, as well as makes it easier for them to be involved with their child's care and education. Federal policy ought to enable and at least not discourage state and local districts and businesses from these kind of arrangements. And policymakers can support states and local school districts to take these steps to enable low-income families to get their children the education they deserve. Of course, there's nothing a school can do to help a child better than be a good school. And that usually in involves having the best possible teaching. Uh, Harvard economist Raj Chetty has done studies showing that a good teacher improves earnings and for girls reduces teenage pregnancy. A study at Promise Academy in the Harlem Children's Zone found that girls attending that school, a high-performing charter school, were 12 percentage points less likely to have a child as a teenager. Results like these show how great teachers in schools could put their students on track to college and eventually the kinds of jobs that enable them to move out of the cycle of poverty. And then there's one more suggestion for how a school might help parents do what parents don't do as well today in our society. And that is what is popularly called wraparound services. Professor Coleman's suggestion was if parents don't do it, schools should. In which case, we should be looking at a whole range of services schools ought to be providing. This takes us far afield from the traditional role of the school described by Albert Shanker. There are today many social programs that are not school-based, many funded by the federal government, others by the states, that are designed to support families that need help. Welfare programs, child care vouchers, earned income tax credits, a housing allowance. The total amount spent by the federal government on these kind of safety net programs was $398 billion in 2013, or about 12% of the federal budget. Some are suggesting that some of these services should be wrapped around the school, that the school should become the dominant institution through which children whose families are unable to provide basic support receive them. I'm not so sure. There is a limit to what the school can be expected to do, and there's a limit to what the government can do. 
If the challenges single parents face are so great, at the very least, the government can make sure it does no harm and does nothing to discourage marriage. Yet there is strong evidence that is precisely what the government is doing. In testimony before the Senate Budget Committee last year, Robert Doerr of the American Enterprise Institute said that our policies aimed at assisting low and moderate income households with children often penalize marriage. Doerr said, quote, a single parent with two children who earns 15000 earns an income, earned income tax credit benefit of about $4,100. The credit decreases by 21 cents for every dollar a married couple earns above $15,000. So if the single parent marries someone earning $10,000 for a combined income of $25,000, the tax credit benefit will drop to about $2,200. In other words, the couple faces a marriage tax penalty of about $1,900. He continued, similar penalties are embedded in Medicaid, in temporary assistance for needy families, in food stamps, housing assistance, and child care, all of which apply to low and moderate income Americans. Efforts to mitigate marriage penalties have largely taken the form of tax cuts directed toward married couples, but 81% of that relief flowed to couples earning above $75,000. Doerr suggests that a host of reforms could alleviate this burden including implementing a maximum, a maximum marginal tax rate for low-income families that would tamp marriage-induced hikes in rates, providing a subsidy on individual earnings, not combined earnings, like the earned income tax credit. He said that would enable a low-wage American to marry someone with a child, but to do so without sacrificing significant income or transfer payments. And mandatory individual filing as done in Canada, Australia, Italy, and Japan, would either require or allow low-income individuals to avoid income tax penalties. But perhaps the wisest advice on this subject came from American Enterprise Institute fellow W. Bradford Wilcox, who said this, government's role when it comes to strengthening marriage and family life is necessarily limited. Any successful 21st century effort to renew the fortunes of marriage in America will depend more on civic institutions, businesses, and ordinary Americans than upon federal and state efforts to strengthen family life. What would Pat Moynihan say today? Well, surely it would be creative, it would be entertaining, insightful, probably controversial. And since those on today's panels are among those who know him best, and those who know this subject the best, I'll let them answer that question. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Do you want to take any questions? No. Oh, sir. Right. Well, thank you very much. Bill, good to see you. I'll send you that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Senator, for that very substantive uh, detailed, thoughtful presentation, uh, which is what we have grown to um, expect from you, and, but it is uh, welcome to see it uh, once again today. Uh, something I said to myself, well, you know, we need to put this in writing. That, this is a very thoughtful set of observations that uh, people need to have a chance to, uh, to read and, and think about, so I'm, I'm hopeful that that will that will happen. Um, but now I'd like to um, move to the second stage of the uh, event today, uh, the uh, panel discussion, the first panel discussion. Uh, and uh, it's going to uh, be uh, chaired by Gerard Robinson because our original chair was uh, held up in Boston by the weather. Uh, but before introducing Gerard, I just want to uh, thank the Hoover Institution for all of its, uh, uh, will, its willingness to make this lavish facility available to us uh, for its uh, technological support and for uh, all the uh, amenities that they have provided. So uh, thank you very much to uh, the uh, Johnson offices of the Hoover Institution, which have just opened this year. And so this is an opportunity to see a, a fabulous new facility in Washington. 
And I also want to uh, thank the uh, staff of the Program on Education Policy and Governance that have helped put this together and the, uh, all the editors at Education Next who played such a critical role in, in um, bringing the, the volume of the journal together. And as well as to thank you once again for uh, joining us today, either online or in the room. Uh, but now let me uh, introduce uh, Gerard Robinson, who's been uh, for many years associated with our program on education policy and governance. Uh, Gerard was the former commissioner of education in the state of Florida. And uh, he has uh, also been the former commissioner of education in the state of Virginia. And so he has a very long history of uh, interest and commitment to K-12 education. He's now working with an uh, exciting new university, which is uh, uh, opening up online opportunities uh, for education at the higher education level. Uh, and uh, Gerard, it's just a pleasure having you here today uh, chairing our first panel. And I will leave you with the responsibility of introducing the uh, members of the panel. And perhaps the panelists can, can come up to the... Thank you, Dr. Peterson, for the very kind introduction. First of all, let me say welcome to the uh, Hoover Institution, where ideas define a free society are alive and well. I can think of very few issues that help define a free society than families and the role they play in strengthening our democratic system of government. Fifty years ago this month, a 39-year-old Patrick Moynihan, at that time an assistant secretary in the Department of Labor during the Johnson administration, had published a report, uh, the, uh, the Negro Family, a Challenge for National Action. At the time, 100 copies were produced, and that 78-page report played a strategic role in helping to shape a national narrative. Fifty years later, they were still discussing about the American family. There were two themes in 1950, uh, uh, at that time, 1965, that people wanted an answer to. The first theme, what are the causes and consequences of single parent families? And number two, what role can we play in strengthening families and improving government? If we fast forward uh, 50 years later to 2015, guess what? Those two themes are still alive and well today. And so we've assembled a panel of four people, some of the leading academic uh, and, and public intellectuals in the country, to help us talk about the consequences and uh, the uh, causes of single parent families. First, we have Dr. Paul Peterson, who is a shadow professor of government at Harvard University, as well as the editor in chief of Education Next. He's going to speak to us uh, about a, a paper, actually, a, a PDF as well, on uh, the impact of uh, social policy on changes in family structure. And he's going to provide a very strong presentation. We have Dr. Wilson, uh, who's a Geyser professor of a university professor at Harvard University. He's one of the major uh, sociologists and thinkers in the nation. He's going to make a presentation today on concentrated poverty and black male struggle for work, a subject that he has uh, discussed for many years. We have uh, Dr. Greg Duncan, who is a distinguished professor at the University of California, Irvine, in the Department of Education, and also with connections to the economics, uh, psychology, and social behavior department. He will discuss family structure and educational attainment. Lastly, we have uh, George Will, a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, columnist for the Washington Post, also an author of many books, and one of the people in the nation we listen to when we have discussions about public policy uh, and families. They are actually, uh, in, in, I introduced them in the order in which they will speak. Each person has approximately 12 minutes to uh, make a presentation. Afterward, we will open it up for a question and answer period from the audience. We do ask that you wait for someone to bring a mic, since we're streaming live, to ask your question. And I'll repeat, ask a question, not give a uh, speech. And with uh, nothing else to say on this matter, I want to turn over to our first speaker, Dr. Paul Peterson. OK, so in this uh, presentation, I have the responsibility of summarizing the critical paper for the a discussion today by Sarah McClanahan and Christopher Jenks. It's really a very deep and rich paper that uh, brings together uh, decades of learning that these two scholars uh, have um, uh, uh, undertaken 
over the years. And it's, 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 it's a distillation of uh, an enormous amount of knowledge about single parents. And I just think it's an extraordinary resource. And, and I wish that Sarah had been able to make it uh, to give the presentation herself. Uh, but uh, I think we can get the content in any case. And I'll try to go through it quickly and then just refer a little bit to my own uh, much smaller contribution uh, to the discussion. So um, let me begin by, uh, let's see if we can get to make, make our little ticker work here. Um, All right. No. Maybe there's a technician here who can help me. There we go. There we go. Okay, now I've got it. Okay, so the key points that I want to make in summarizing their paper and adding my own thoughts is there are five. One, single parenthood is undesirable for children. We've heard that already. Uh, among African Americans, single parenthood has increased rapidly since the Moynihan Report was written, but it's not a phenomenon exclusive to the African American community as was originally suggested by Moynihan when he entitled his report the Negro family. It might have appeared to have been a problem specific to the African American community when Moynihan wrote that report, but we can no longer see that as the central thought for our time. And the fourth point is, is that uh, government seems to have affected this as Senator Alexander has suggested, and that finally, the policy recommendation is we need to rethink government policy with respect to low-income families so that government subsidizes marriage rather than taxes it. So those are the main points. Uh, you can uh, turn off your TV set now or your computer if that's all you want. But if you want the documentation, I think it's really uh, important to understand that um, there's a lot of evidence that supports these conclusions. So I'm gonna back up here, see if I can do that, and just emphasize the point that the senator made, which is that 40% of single parent families are living in poverty. 8% of dual parent families are living in poverty. There's nothing we can do to reduce poverty more quickly than to increase the number of dual parent families. Now, one of the things that McLanahan and Jenks do is they take and bring together 45 quasi-experimental studies to really tease out exactly how important is family structure on behavior of children and the experiences of children and the life chances of children. You know, there's so many correlations between income and education and family structure that it's difficult to tease out the specific effects of family structure. But there are a number of studies that have done that. And these two scholars have actually done their best to summarize those results. And here's where you see the big negative effects on high school graduation rates, not on test scores. They don't find much evidence for test scores, but they do on the much more important variable, high school graduation. Mental health, aggressiveness, rule breaking, delinquency, illegal drug use. Big effects. Single parent effects on employment, not so much on the income of the employed, but the chances of whether or not a person will be employed when adult is very much affected by their experiences as a child. Family formation, non-marital birth <coughs> rates, 
for women, divorce rates for men and women, not so clearly on the marriage rate. These effects are larger for boys than for girls. So the penalty paid by the son of a single parent is much greater than that of a daughter. But they say we cannot detect any racial differences. Single parent families are, do not have good effects for either whites or blacks or Hispanics. We don't see that there's any differential effects depending on your racial group. Okay, so the Moynihan Report, we're taking note of it. But I think one of the things we have to honestly say is that we can't see that the report itself had in the short run any positive effects on public policy. If anything, it had a negative effect, perhaps in part because of the reception it received at the time. It was such a controversial report. As James Patterson points out in his essay, which he would have presented to you all had he been able to fly down from Brown University today. Uh, so if you look at the data, what's really interesting about the data in detail, this is in the McClanahan and Jenks uh, paper, is that births to unmarried mothers uh, increase very dramatically in the black community uh, right after this report is written. But not only in the black community, also in the white community and the Hispanic community. And the red line shows the overall increase for all families in the United States. So this is births to unmarried mothers. But I think that's less important than the fact that the percentage of children living with an unmarried mother, after all, mothers may have a child and then get married, but this is the percentage of children living with an unmarried mother. And that, too, increased very dramatically immediately after the report was written, especially in the black community, but also more generally. The second thing that you can notice in this slide in particular, but also in the preceding slide, is that single parenthood tops out and around the mid-1990s. It has not increased since 1995 within the black community. And it has not really increased overall, that red line up there, uh, since 1995. There might see be some slight upticks in the Hispanic community and in the white community, perhaps, but even there, it's fairly level. So there's almost good news here that the problem, although a serious one, the plateau is a very high plateau that we are experiencing, but the, situa the steep trend line upward was back in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, not recently. So why? What is the reason for that? Let me see if I can get back to where I want to be here. Um, why is that? So here are four potential causes. You may have some others you want to bring to the table. One is male unemployment. Very plausible explanation that uh, William Julius Wilson is going to discuss. Second, female labor force participation. Third, changing social values. Four, the tax on marriage. So I'm just going to show you a little bit of evidence that suggests that there's some connection between female labor force participation and single parent families. Uh, it does go up in the 60s and 70s. It does plateau in the 90s. The trend lines are similar. But very few people see a causal connection there. Maybe somebody will offer an explanation. It's probably more likely that th the access to the labor market enabled women to survive if they were single parents rather than that they were, that this was a driving force. I tend to not think it's a terribly significant factor. Um, social values. Now, the one indicator I picked up, uh, you may have some other thoughts as to better indicators, is, okay, is religion having an influence on American society? Well, we see a, a significant decline in people's thinking that it is having a significant uh, effect on society back in the time when single parenthood was growing very rapidly. 
in the 70s and 80s. That's what this graph shows. And this graph also shows that uh, people reverse their thinking when we get to the 1990s, even before 2001, which has a very dramatic effect. That's what that big dip there is in 2001, is 9-11. Is uh, and then we also see that it's, uh, the losing uh, its impact has increased more recently. So one might be concerned if social values are the key thing, declining influence of religion is the key thing, and the senator suggested that, then we should be very worried about the recent trend line might be a signal that things could get worse again. But the argument that the senator made that I found particularly persuasive was that welfare policies can tax the institution of marriage. That the creation of a, a, a poverty trap, you're better off in terms of uh, material resources if you don't get married than if you do get married. And he laid that out, out very clearly. Now, the point that I'd add to what the senator said is that welfare benefits expanded rapidly in the 70s. We all know that. Uh, the, uh, Aid to Families with Dependent Children program was liberalized, Medicaid was put into place, food stamp program grew very rapidly, housing assistance, supplementary social insurance, and to some extent, minor extent, the earned income tax credit. So this thing jumped on me again. Uh, and there it shows the food stamp participation rate that jumps up in the 1970s and then drops in the 1990s, interestingly enough, uh, only to rise again more recently. Um, now, David Elwood, the dean at the Kennedy School where uh, Professor Wilson and I both teach, uh, made an observation in 2000 that in the middle of the 1990s there were very important welfare changes. The number of households receiving welfare, which had risen or held steady in all but four years between 1960 and 1992, suddenly begins to plummet in the early 1990s, and by 1998, it had declined by 50%. So there's a huge change in welfare policy in the United States in the 1990s, which is reducing the tax on marriage. Uh, and at the same time, the earned income tax credit is being expanded very rapidly, which you can see here in this graph. The, the rapid expansion of the earned income tax credit took place in the 1990s, it didn't take place in the 1970s. And the earned income tax credit, although not the best design policy, if you want to preserve the institution of marriage, is better than the other policies, the other welfare policies that we have. This can be greatly improved. But the fact that this has been the welfare program that has expanded in the recent period may help to explain why it is that the institution of marriage has survived better more recently than it did uh, when in the years immediately after the Moynihan report. So with that, I have, want to leave you with a couple of conclusions. One is there are some things we can do something about. There are other things we can't do anything about. One thing we can do uh, something about is something Bill Wilson is going to talk about, male unemployment. And we need to think about what can we do to reduce male unemployment, especially among young adults. And secondly, we can improve our educational system, and the senator had a lot of interesting observations to say on that point. And third, we can redesign our welfare programs, not to eliminate them, that's not the proposal that they should be eliminated, but that the institution of marriage should be fundamental and central to our thinking about how to design those programs because there is nothing out there that we can do in this space that can do more to create equal opportunity for children and uh, better opportunities for family life than to redesign the programs that currently may have done more harm than they have benefited the population that they have sought to serve. So with that, I uh, leave it to uh, Professor Wilson to extend this idea by taking a closer oh, look. Oh, extend that idea. <laughs> <laughs> At uh, unemployment rates. OK.
Do I need, I need that? Oh, you do. So what's, how do you work it? Oh, that's a, that's hard to do. But this side moves it forward, that side moves it backwards. This side moves it backwards, this side? No, this side moves right. it forward. That's good, okay. okay. So I have uh, 12 minutes. Don't start it yet. <laughs> um, well, I have a chance to respond to Paul uh, during the question and answer period, so I won't respond during the presentation. Okay, good. With all due respect, <laughs> oh, I would like to just comment on your thoughtful paper uh, remarks. Uh, thank you for coming out in this weather. Um, However, uh, coming from uh, Chicago and then Boston, <laughs> it always amazes me to see how this city shuts down after you get three or four inches of snow. Uh, I'm at the, uh, on leave this year at the Library of Congress, and I went there a, a few, uh, several days ago when you had four inches of snow and, and the building was shut down. I was, I was amazed. Um, so my presentation this afternoon uh, is based on the paper uh, I co-authored with uh, uh, James Kwan and Jacqueline Wan uh, entitled uh, Black Men and the Struggle for Work, Economic and Social Barriers Persist, uh, which appears in the current edition of Education Next to com commemorate uh, the 50th anniversary of the uh, Moynihan Report. Now, driven by a deep dissatisfaction with the declining economic and social condition of the black family, uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan hoped with the release of his 1965 report uh, to stimulate a national discussion linking economic disadvantage and family instability. And although uh, he devoted most of a chapter to a consideration of the structural causes of the fragmentation of the black family, uh, critics associated the report uh, with a culture of poverty thesis, uh, which implied that poverty is passed from one generation to the next through learned behavior. However, unlike uh, uh, many uh, conservative analysts, Moynihan combined economic and cultural explanations for the persistence of poverty and family breakups. Uh, nevertheless, the controversy that surrounded the, the report undermined for decades serious research on the complexity of the problem. Now my book, uh, The Truly Disadvantaged, uh, rekindled the debate with its discussion of institutional and cultural dynamics in the social transformation of the inner city. And the book chronicled the rise of poor black single mothers with children, the decline in marriage among the poor, the increase in concentrated urban black poverty, and escalating joblessness among young black males. The truly disadvantaged describe social, cultural, and institutional mechanisms that further exacerbate such patterns. In, ad in addition, that study linked social demographic changes in the inner city to shifts in the labor market, the outmigration of higher income black and white families, and the concomit concomitant decline in services to poor black families left behind. The analysis suggests that in such neighborhoods, many households lack the resources necessary to sustain family life, but it links that fact to structural factors such as persistent exclusion from employment opportunities, social networks, 
and institutions that are essential for economic mobility. The consequences of this persistent exclusion for children can be devastating. Even at the earliest stages in their cognitive development, inner city black children are less likely to be enrolled in a high quality child care arrangement which puts them at an enormous disadvantage compared to their white and better off counterparts. Furthermore, poor communities have fewer options when it comes to the provision of regulated child care. And these programs are also disproportionately more likely to experience funding cuts during periods of austerity. Complicating these realities is the fact that Child care choices among poor inner city residents are also constrained by issues of trust and safety that often outweigh quality. The net result is that inadequate preschool education has become, has inadequate preschool education has important implications for the social and economic domains of child development and the negative ramifications can last well into adulthood. When they enter primary school, low-income inner-city black youth are often clustered in failing schools, and they are more likely to be suspended or enrolled in special education classes, less likely to graduate from high school on time, and, and indeed, more likely to drop out altogether. Consequently, as they enter adulthood, many young blacks, especially males, are less likely to enter the workforce or post-secondary educational institutions. As we can see here in figure one, figure one indicates, as figure one indicates, young black males have been unemployed and disconnected from schools and vocational institutions at rates ranging from 20 to 33% since 1976. By 2011, after the end of the Great Recession, more than one quarter of young black males were neither employed nor enrolled in school or vocational training. The rates for their white and Hispanic counterparts were also high, around 20%, but throughout most of the past few decades, rates of disconnection, among, uh, 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 rates of disconnection from education and the labor force among black youth have been persistently higher than for the other two groups. And the rates are no doubt even higher for young black males who live in high poverty inner city neighborhoods. High poverty inner city neighborhoods are often where problems associated with joblessness, inadequate schools, low quality providers, and other social dislocations cluster. Yet, youth exposed to these influences are expected to share the aspirations and expectations of their counterparts in better off communities and to acquire the capacity to make the choices necessary to realize it. Low income parents are often severely constrained in their ability to help guide their children's engagement with critical facilitators of upward mobility such as schools and it is left to youth themselves to formulate and exercise strategic choices that might prove to be avenues out of poverty. These youth are seriously impeded, however, as a result of the gap between the knowledge they accumulate in the restrictive social environment in which they operate and the skills and know-how they need to transcend it. In such neighborhoods, the effect of negative youth outcomes increases significantly. Chronically poor neighborhoods, those with poverty rates at or above 
have higher rates of school dropouts, teenage pregnancy, and crime, and lower scores on cognitive and verbal skill tests and health indicators among school-aged children compared to their counterparts in better-off neighborhoods. As shown in figure two, many poor black and Hispanic children are disproportionately exposed to conditions in high poverty neighborhoods with all of their deleterious impacts on family well-being. Between 1990 and 2000, a period of economic growth and tight labor markets, the percentage of poor black children living in neighborhoods of concentrated poverty declined from 24 to 15 percent. But the improvement was short-lived, however, and the rates began to increase in the next decade, coinciding with worsening economic conditions. Although not as sharp, the trend line for all black children followed a similar pattern, showing the increased likelihood that black children across all socioeconomic strata reside in highly disadvantaged neighborhoods compared to poor and non-poor white children. The residential distribution of poor and, no, and non-poor Hispanic children followed a somewhat different pattern from that of blacks, influenced in part by a 29% growth in this population since 2000 and their subsequent migration to less blighted regions in the United States. Like black children, however, Hispanic children of any socioeconomic background are disproportionately more likely to live in high poverty neighborhoods than white children. Confronting poverty and inequality in the inner city requires that we recognize the complex interrelated problems facing poor families. This necessitates an effective, sustained, and coordinated mission of government-funded institutions to support opportunities for economic self-sufficiency among the poor, which is yet to be realized. Recently, the Obama administration funded several efforts to revitalize poor, under-resourced neighborhoods by expanding, quote, ladders of opportunity, unquote, for youth of color. For example, choice and promise neighborhoods promise zones and the strong city, strong community, communities initiatives seek to enhance family and community ties and better embed households and networks of institutional supports to improve the in-school and extracurricular experiences of school-aged children. However, Congressly, Congress has seriously hampered replication and expansion of these programs by refusing the administration's repeated requests for additional funds. Fifty years ago, Moynihan worried that too much responsibility was being placed on community action programs to address the problems of persistent family poverty. He implied that these initiatives only go part of the way toward influencing the choice sets available to the poor, as well as the actions such choices energize. Rather, the socialization that motivates these actions and choices must involve more coordinated, government-directed efforts to alter the alignment of forces that reinforce racial and class-based biases and inequalities. To this end, Moynihan called for an expansion of such things as youth employment opportunities, improvements in high quality education programs, greater housing options, and a broadening of income supplements to combat inequality. These things are as important today 
as it was in 1960, as they were in 1965. Now, regrettably, the misinterpretation and intense criticisms of the implicit culture of poverty observations in Monaghan's report precluded a serious public discussion of the need to tackle these impediments to the progress of the poor. Even more regrettable, the need to acknowledge and address them is all the more urgent 50 years later. Thank you. My tutorial. Oh, what do I get? This is the forward. This is the oh, back. Okay. Don't touch that. That's right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for uh, the opportunity to contribute uh, a chapter to this uh, Ed Next edition uh, and to participate in the panel. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, ours is a um, demographic look at uh, family structure and educational attainment uh, over the period of time since uh, the Moynihan report came out. Um, it's easy to see what has happened uh, in terms of educational differences between single parent families and two parent families. Uh, this tracks back to the late 60s. Uh, the fraction of children observed in adolescence, either living with a single parent or two parents, uh, and then looking at these same children 10 years later to see how many have graduated from college. You get a similar kind of picture if you look at just years of completed schooling or college attendance or other measures of educational attainment. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the gap has grown very substantially. Uh, even though there's been some progress at the bottom, graduation rates have tripled actually from 4% to 12% among uh, children in single parent families. Uh, the, the gap has increased because the uh, college completion rates of children in two parent families has increased so much. So this is just a correlation. Uh, as Paul talked about, the uh, McClanahan and Jenks chapter uh, article, uh, which I would also commend, it's a wonderful uh, summary, uh, provided uh, much more uh, rigorous evidence on the links between family structure and, uh, uh, and educational attainment, uh, showing, as Paul pointed out, uh, that there are indeed causal effects of single parent family structure on completed schooling, uh, but not test scores, uh, that these impacts tend to be larger for boys than girls. Uh, and interestingly, the impacts seem to be every bit as large for white families uh, as they are for black families. And this causal channel appears to be related to the behaviors uh, rather than cognitive skills. So I want to take a bit of a broader perspective. Uh, these are the gaps in the graduation rates uh, if you classify children according to family status. Uh, oops. If you look instead at uh, income differences and the uh, gaps according to whether children in their adolescence are observed to be living in families in the bottom or top 20% of the income distribution, uh, you get a similar and much more dramatic picture. Uh, children in the bottom 20% have graduation rates that have doubled, but from 4% to only 8%. Uh, children in the top 20% have graduation rates that have gone up from 31% to 59%. In other words, the gap has increased very, very substantially. Uh, and single parent, uh, Family structure is only one of several demographic changes that have taken place uh, over the last 50 years to contribute to this. Um, and in our, our article uh, in the issue, we try to assess the relative importance of uh, a number of these demographic factors, family structure, uh, age of mother at the birth of a child, uh, education of parents, family size, all these things have been linked to completed schooling. Uh, and I'll present a little bit more data in a second, but the bottom line is that single parent family structure changes uh, working to the disadvantage of uh, low income children uh, account for about a quarter of the increase in the college graduation gap or the completed schooling gap uh, 
of high versus low income kids. Um, these other factors, uh, age of mother at birth of the child, turns out to be even more important. Uh, it's very interesting. There's a growing gap. Uh, even though the teen fertility rates have declined, uh, the uh, age of mothers when children are born for high income families uh, has increased very rapidly. Uh, it's not changed very much uh, for low income families. Uh, in part because even though teen births have declined, family size has declined also. So the typical child is born to uh, uh, a low-income child to a mother who's uh, in her early 20s. And the rates for uh, the ages for the high-income kids have, have gone up more and more and more. And there are substantial advantages to being born to an older mother. And this isn't just uh, once you get out of the, the teen years, uh, these effects stop growing but they continue to grow uh, through uh, out the 20s and early 30s. So the kind of maturity and experience that, uh, that parents bring when they have their child at a later age uh, works to the advantage of, uh, of kids. And these kind of uh, increasing gaps in age of mother at, first, at, at the birth of the child uh, turn out to be even more important than family structure differences. Uh, education, of course, matters a lot, but here uh, low-income families have caught up uh, have begun to catch up, I should say, uh, to high-income families in terms of their uh, completed schooling. Low-income parents had only about eight years of schooling uh, back in the 1960s. That's increased to uh, almost 12 years now. Uh, it's still far below what high-income families achieve, but the gap has actually narrowed, uh, as has the gap in family size. Uh, Low-income family sizes have fallen very, very substantially. Uh, they've fallen a bit for high-income families, but uh, they've uh, fallen even faster for low-income families. So uh, if you look at the, the associations between these four factors and completed schooling, uh, you end up with uh, similar kinds of associations with family structure, uh, age of the mother at the birth of the child, number of siblings. Uh, by far the most important correlate of uh, children's completed schooling is parental completed schooling, which you might expect. Um, one of the things that we discovered that is very uh, worrisome in the context of single parent families, if you look at the, the single parent family association and break it up uh, across uh, the, the 35 years that we were looking at uh, into the first, second, and third thirds of this period, uh, what you find is that the association between uh, being raised in a single parent family and completed schooling is much stronger now than it used to be. So uh, that is uh, a worrisome trend. Uh, we don't understand it yet, but it's something that we need to be uh, uh, alert to. Um, the um, Michael Petrilli chapter is also very good. It talks about um, non-family approaches to try to uh, alleviate these problems. Uh, the conference, I think, properly focuses on uh, family structure as uh, a serious problem and we need to think about uh, approaches to uh, trying to uh, reduce the gap in single parent family structures between high and low income families. Uh, but we also need to have other kinds of uh, interventions also. And uh, the Petrilli chapter uh, talks about career academies, which uh, is a very interesting attempt to try to create within uh, high schools uh, uh, tracks that involve vocational education and smaller learning uh, communities within larger high schools that seem to have quite uh, substantial impacts on high school graduation, on college attendance, and even in uh, promoting marriage. It's one of the few interventions where uh, you had impacts on marriage rates. Um, Shelley also and Senator Alexander talked about charter schools. Uh, I think for charter schools, it's important to realize that for uh, every very successful charter school, there's a very unsuccessful charter school, and on balance, charter schools uh, are neither um, no better uh, nor worse than, um, than public schools, on average. But there are some very uh, spectacular examples of successful charter schools that we should be uh, learning from. Uh, I want to talk in my remaining uh, minutes about uh, another initiative uh, educational initiative that proved particularly beneficial for uh, black male students. Um, this was a, a movement in New York City 
um, to try to form uh, a network of small high schools. There have been many attempts to uh, try to promote achievement through small high schools. Most of them have failed. If you merely break up a, a large high school into a number of small high schools and don't change anything else, nothing happens. Uh, but what uh, New York City did, this is uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, it preceded the Joel Klein administration but was embraced by the Joel Klein administration, uh, was to uh, host a, a design competition for what turned out to be more than 200 small high schools uh, where the, the designs for these high schools had to meet certain criteria that uh, the people who were designing this, uh, Bob Hughes and Michelle Cahill, uh, had learned through many failures to be very important uh, features of small high schools. For example, community partnerships. Uh, every uh, proposal that came in for a small high school had to involve a community partner uh, in a very serious way. In fact, the planning grant uh, for the small high school went to the community partner rather than the, uh, the school itself. So um, this uh, let 200 and some flowers bloom and the uh, evaluation uh, that MDRC conducted was able to take advantage of the fact that these were public high schools in New York City and kids uh, entered a lottery to get into the small schools. Uh, some kids won the lottery, some kids lost the lottery. Um, so the, uh, the MDRC evaluators were able to compare outcomes for children who won versus those who lost. Uh, impacts were particularly large for black males uh, and uh, here are just a couple of, uh, of the results for black males, graduation rates. So these kids uh, entered the lottery going into ninth grade. So you're comparing all the kids regardless of what happened to them who won the lottery versus those who lost. Uh, graduation rates, these are four-year graduation rates, uh, ended up being uh, 12 points higher uh, for black males who uh, got into these small schools of choice. Uh, and college enrollment ended up being uh, a third larger, 11 percentage points larger. So uh, I want us, as we think about approaches, policy approaches to the family, uh, to also be thinking about uh, additional kind of policy approaches, particularly those involving schools uh, that might um, be used to try to address the kind of problems that Bill Wilson talked about. Thank you very much. <coughs> I do not need a tutorial because I have no graphics because <clears throat> as my children explain, I'm not smart enough for a s smartphone. And they were right about that. And I won't venture onto this. Uh, I'm the only person here also who's not a professor, although before I turned to journalism, or as my father, a professor of philosophy, said before I sank to journalism, <laughs> I was briefly a college professor. And I do remember the night in June 1976 when two of my friends ran for the Senate against each other. They were both nominated that night. One was Bill Buckley, the incumbent senator from New York, and the other was um, uh, uh, Pat Moynihan, who had just survived by 10,000 votes, a primary against uh, Congresswoman Bella Abzug. And <laughs> over at Jim's headquarters, he said, I look forward to running against Professor Moynihan, and I'm sure Professor Moynihan will run the kind of high-level campaign you'd expect of a professor from Harvard. <laughs> And over at Pat said, quarter was a journalist, said, Pat, uh, Jim is referring to you as Professor Moynihan. And Pat pulled himself up to his considerable height and said, ah, oh, the mudslinging has begun. <laughs> <laughs> In 1994, Congress, as it is wont to do, gave an edict to the future. In a piece of legislation called Goals 2000, Congress said, by the year 2000, American high school students, seniors, would be first in the world in math and science, and we would have a high school graduation rate of 90%. Uh, they weren't, and we didn't. Pat's response to this piece of legislation was in four words. He said, that will not happen. He said, that is akin to Soviet grain quotas, solemnly avowed but not taken seriously. Part of his wit, and he used wit to counter the legacy of uh, excoriation he'd experienced after the Moynihan report. He said at about this time, when they were debating Goals 2000, that the crucial determinant quality of schools 
by standardized tests was the proximity of the schools to the Canadian border. If you wanted to raise your math scores, you should move your school close to the Canadian border. This was an, an oblique way that Pat had of saying that high cognitive outputs correlate less with high per pupil expenditures than with a high percentage of two parent families which are not distributed randomly in the country. Rather, they mapped minority and particularly African American population distribution. He knew this 30, uh, 30 years before that, however, when he noticed something that came to be called by his friend James Q. Wilson, Moynihan's scissors. He noticed a map in which two lines crossed in a way that was not just counterintuitive but ominous. The declining line in these, it seemed to replicate the blades of the scissors, the declining line showed declining welfare, uh, sorry, declining male African American principally unemployment rate. The rising line showed simultaneously rising welfare caseload. Uh, this was simply not supposed to happen. This broken correlation between improved unemployment and decreased welfare dependency was, as I say, ominous. Because at that time, the conventional wisdom was uh, that of the president at the time, uh, John Kennedy, who said a rising economic tide raises all boats. We were going to have social salvation through economic growth and the removal of barriers as with the Civil Rights Act. What was ominous was the thought that bad culture would defeat good economic numbers. This was ominous because government knows how to alter incentives and to remove barriers. It does not know how to fine tune culture. Well, Pat, of course, was denounced as a racist and accused of blaming the victim. And as a result, much debate was stifled and much research prevented. Caused Pat to say later, ideological certainty easily uh, degenerates into insistence upon ignorance. We know the basic numbers. When Pat wrote, he said the case for national action was that 23.6% of African American children were born out of wedlock. Today it has tripled that at 72%. Today, 43% of all first births of all races and ethnicities in the United States are to unmarried women, and a majority of the mothers in America under 30 are not living with the fathers of their children. This has had a profound influence on how we think about social policy. In 1966, Sergeant Shriver, appointed by Lyndon Johnson to be head of the War on Poverty, was asked in Congress uh, how long it would take to eliminate poverty in America, and he said about 10 years, which made sense if you thought there was a direct correlation between <coughs> improved employment and declining poverty and welfare. 30 years later, I was uh, in the course of journalism uh, visiting a school in Chicago. This was at a time when a teacher in Chicago had said she routinely had seven-year-olds coming to school who knew neither numbers, shapes, or colors. As the teacher said, no one while making dinner ever turned to the children and said, 10 green round peas. Well, I was out of school on the west side of Chicago, an area particularly devastated by the migration of uh, manufacturing from industrial cities to South Carolina and then to South Korea and elsewhere. Uh, and I was at a school where uh, wonderful, fa public school, wonderful faculty, hardworking students, and this faculty there said to me, we'll do anything for our children, but we never send homework home. And why was that, I asked. They said, because 85% of our children go home after school to be the parents of their siblings. Pat, again, saw all this coming. <clears throat> After the Second World War, when the baby boom generation began going through the public schools like a pig through a python, everyone was agreed, uh, consensus across the political spectrum, that the best predictor of the school's performance was the amount of money you spent on it. Increased financial inputs, cognitive outputs would increase, and so we did. Uh, class sizes went down, good schools were built, teachers' salaries went up, everything improved except performance as measured by standardized tests. So, in the 1960s, we decided to look at it with one of the largest social science efforts in American history that produced the Coleman Report, James Coleman of Johns Hopkins University. While uh, Coleman was in the field but getting his results, Pat went back to Harvard 
uh, where he was attending a party and someone came up and said, Pat, have you heard what Coleman's finding? It's all families. All families. The report, when it came out, was so seismic, to use Pat's words, so seismic that the Johnson administration released it on the Friday of the 4th of July weekend, hoping no one would notice. <laughs> what was learned from Coleman was that the differences in schools' performance can be about 90% explained by variables such as concerning the quality of the families from which the children come to school, quantity and quality of reading matter in the home, the amount of homework done in the home, the amount of television watched in the home, but most important, do not tell me the parent, the uh, pupil-teacher ratio, tell me the pupil-parent ratio. As Pat used to say, you cannot learn algebra at the dinner table. You can, you can learn a great many other things. If we were talking about the division of labor between what the schools can and cannot be expected to do. Uh, 1960 election that brought Pat <coughs> to Washington really was supposed to empower the American professorate, professor, rather, the social scientists in particular. It was to produce, Pat was to write later, the direct transmission of social science into governmental policy. This foundered on what Pat later called the obstinacy of things and led him to say, after his experience with the Moynihan Report and other matters, the role of social science lies not in the formulation of social policy, but in the measurement of its results. That is, he meant not in postulating what will work, but in demonstrating what does work, and of course, more often than not, what does not work. We do not know, at this point, 50 years on, the cause of the social regression about which Pat was so prescient. Uh, because uh, conservatives believe that because liberals think government can do more good than it actually can do, conservatives are inclined to think it's responsible for more of the world's ills than in fact it is. But certainly what Pat called iatrogenic government has contributed to this in some probably small measure. An iatrogenic illness is an illness caused by a physician or a medicine. And there are uh, reasons to believe that perverse incentives for family formation were in our welfare systems. But Pat came to believe later in life that culture controls far more than incentives can control. He was fond of re remembering a conversation he had with a very distinguished Harvard chemist who talked about the mini-body problem. And he said that exists in physical science and perhaps in the social sciences, that when the number of variables interacting with one another make the situation extraordinarily complicated and difficult to fathom. And Pat, hearing him say this, asked this distinguished chemist, at what number of variables does the problem begin? And the chemist looked at Pat as so surely you're kidding me, surely you know that the number is three. In other words, in dealing with these astonishing complex social problems and social systems, uh, deciphering cause and correlation and formulating policies is extraordinarily difficult, which is why he stressed over and over again that government should try to be ameliorative rather than transformative. If government is good, for example, he said that writing checks not writing the rules of new behavior. Uh, Pat's dear friend, James Q. Wilson, a colleague at Harvard, of course formulated three rules for avoiding poverty. I think I've got them right by memory. He said, graduate from high school, uh, don't have a child until you're married, and don't get married until you're 20. Obey those three rules and your chances of being in, in lasting poverty uh, are vanishingly small. Well. That is the, the context 50 years on from what we've learned and more important what we still have not yet learned about the social regression that Pat uh, pointed us to. We are today sadder but wiser, sadder because we are wiser, but at least we're wiser. <laughs> Would you uh, give me the opportunity? We need to give you a mic. So okay. Okay. Well, the stream, so, <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I took some notes here. Turn so. yours on. Huh? 
Can you hear me? Just turn, can you turn your mic? You can on? hear me? Yes. Oh, my mic is on. Okay. So uh, these uh, these thoughtful uh, presentations uh, triggered some thoughts in my mind. <coughs> I'd just like to briefly comment on, beginning first of all with uh, George Will's uh, excellent presentation and his discussion of the Monaghan Scissors. Uh, which created, you know, a real puzzle because we were talking about what Hannah was saying. Look, unemployment is declining. Male unemployment is declining. Yet uh, the rate of, uh, was, of welfare dependency was uh, was increasing. Uh, and so Catherine Neckerman and I went back and we looked at the data, and we didn't just examine unemployment, but we looked at the employment to population ratio, which includes both unemployment and non-labor force participation. And non-labor force participation is a major problem, particularly among young black males who just sort of drop out of the, the you know, labor market. And when we, when we computed the employment to population ratio with welfare dependency, the, the, the line remained positive. And I, so I sent, I sent a, a note to uh, Senator Moynihan about this, and you know, his, you know, his flowerly language, he wrote back and says, oh, Bill, he says, employment to population ratio, and he had exclamation mark. I just wanted to just point that out there, that still, you still had a problem of, of joblessness related to the increase in welfare. Secondly, um, I was very pleased that Greg Duncan uh, made a comment about charter schools. The evidence on, on charter schools is mixed, but there are some very spectacular examples of successful charter schools. I mean, really spectacular. Evidence based on, on random assignments, evaluation by very rigorous scholars, looking at two major cities, Boston and New York. And the students in these charter schools are overwhelmingly students from poor minority backgrounds. For example, in New York, only 4% of the students in New York charter schools are white. Yet these schools in Boston and New York far outperform schools, the, the traditional public schools. And I think we need, instead of just blasting charter schools, we need to take a close look at why the schools in these two major metropolitan areas, or two major cities, why the charter schools are so successful. We should identify the factors that led to their success, and then talk about whether or not they can serve as a model for other schools. The third thing is listening to uh, Paul's uh, very uh, thoughtful comments. I also jotted down some notes. Uh, and um, as I understand your argument, Paul, correct me if, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you were sort of referring to a, a general uh, leveling off in the percentage of children uh, living with uh, an unmarried mother, which begins in the early uh, 1990s. And, and, and you relate this to, as I recall, I also read your paper, you relate this to the expansion of the earned income tax credit as well as the uh, Clinton welfare reform, uh, which, uh, in the uh, which was passed in 1996. Um, that moved large numbers of welfare recipients off the rolls uh, in, and into uh, low-wage work. And you, you really highlighted this as, as very important. And I'm not suggesting it is, and I just want to just point out to you that it is not the case that the percentage of children with unmarried mothers stabilized for all groups since 1990. Uh, when you break these numbers down by mother's race and ethnicity, 
and educational background, you see some differences. Uh, I'm trying to recall the, the uh, Mc, uh, Sarah McClanahan and Christopher Jinks uh, paper, uh, but I do think that they show that rates of unmarried households have only remained steady among black and white mothers who are college graduates. Uh, Andrew Cherlin wrote an excellent book which was just recently published called The Rise and Fall of the Working Class Family in America. And he also found that the rates uh, of unmarried households have only remained steady among black and white mothers who are college graduates. He shows, uh, for example, that the percentage of children living with an unmarried uh, white mother steadily increased among high school dropouts from 1980 uh, 2010. And his book also shows that among blacks, we see an increase in unmarried mother households among women with some college education, but those who have a college education is stabilized. So I think we, we need to disaggregate. Uh, 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 the, the data before we reach conclusions about the powerful impacts of uh, welfare reform. Those are my thoughts. Um, well, Bill, that's, those are uh, good thoughts, and uh, I haven't done that careful disaggregation, but if you look at um, the trend line for all African Americans, uh, in terms of the percentage of children living with an unmarried mother, uh, Sarah McClanahan and, and Christopher Jenks, I had that up on the screen, definitely show an overall decline for the population as a whole. Now, it could be that it's totally concentrated in the upper income, uh, upper educated groups, but I, I doubt yeah. that that's the case. I think you couldn't get an overall trend without it having an impact on low income African Americans. Now, I will say this, that the evidence is the strongest for African Americans that things have improved. It's, it's sort of plateaued uh, for uh, white Americans, but it's, you know, there might be some upward creep. There's not very much. Um, overall, there's not much. There's a little bit more for Hispanics. Uh, but, um, but really, there's nothing at all like it was back in the right. 70s and 80s. It's right. a completely different story. And I'm not trying to dismiss that as a factor. I just want to, you know, I just don't want to place overwhelming emphasis on it because there are a lot of complex factors operating. But Bill probably has a better right. Right. Uh, point to make here. <laughs> I want to hear Bill. <coughs> Only this, uh, okay. and talking about why. This is on this topic that oh, has sure. been discussed. Sure. Okay. Only so perhaps an answer to why charter schools have somewhat better outcomes. Again, goes back to the quality of the families from which the children are coming, because perhaps the children who wind up in the charter schools are the children of parents as, who are socially competent and confident enough to navigate outside the public school system, uh, normal public school system, and then the charter schools. Uh, this is Bell Sawhill from Brookings, and I just wanted to jump in on the conversation uh, that's just been going on about uh, the presentation that you made, Paul, and uh, Bill Wilson's comments on it. Uh, I had some reaction, too, because I think that you were showing some interesting correlations uh, with the trend data, but I think, as you probably know, there's a very extensive literature that tries to, in a much more refined way, get at whether there is any causation between welfare programs and the breakdown of the family. And my reading of that literature is that the effect, it's mixed, as always, but the effects, uh, to the extent they're there, are very small. Uh, I also want to point out that there's a widespread belief amongst even some fairly sophisticated people, um, including, uh, this is something I believed until fairly recently, that the earned income tax credit, which is now, along with food stamps, by far our largest anti-poverty program, very big part of the safety net. Welfare itself is very small now. The earned income tax credit in the aggregate has more ma marriage bonuses than marriage penalties. 
So you can find a case uh, such as the sort that was, um, I think, uh, put forward by the senator where there is indeed a marriage penalty, but overall the program does not discourage marriage. Now some of the other programs may. Uh, food stamps is big and Medicaid is huge and they may have some uh, of the wrong kind of incentives. And then finally I would say even if this is the case and we could all be in favor of a uh, set of welfare programs or safety net programs that don't discourage marriage, and I'd be in favor of that for sure, it's extraordinarily expensive for the most part to fix this problem. And you have to then ask yourself the question, wouldn't it be better to devote those so same resources uh, to something else, improving education, job training, uh, what have you? Uh, so, and then finally, I would say that more and more people are now aware of this, and there are proposals that have been put forward, including one by myself, uh, to fix the marriage penalty, such as it still exists, in the earned income tax credit by doing something that, again, I think has already been alluded to, and that is let's base the uh, benefits on individual earnings, not on household income. And I think uh, it's possible to do that, and there are specific uh, proposals floating around now to do exactly that, and there are people in Congress who would like to do that. Thank you. Any of you like to respond? Okay. Well, we're at a point in time where we're going to turn questions over to uh, the audience, if you will. Um, identify yourself and then address your question to one person on the I have a data question for Greg, and Bill, just identify yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm I'm Bill Galston, uh, senior fellow in governance studies at the Brookings Institution. So I have a data question uh, for Greg, and then a modest provocation for George Will. Uh, <laughs> the uh, the data question for Greg is this, and you may have to speculate. Uh, one of the most striking findings of your paper was that as you went from cohort to cohort to cohort, you were able to do not document a very substantial increase in the independent effect of family structure on things like schooling. Uh, and I guess my question, my question it to you is, do you have any explanations or hypotheses for the fact that this effect seems to be growing over time? Uh, and for George, for George Will, uh, you know, in you know, in an admirable display of bipartisan broad-mindedness, you managed to identify yourself with a core thesis advanced by the National Education. Association, namely that teachers and schools really shouldn't be held responsible for bad outcomes uh, in areas where lots of poor children, with lots of poor children and single mothers. Uh, I find it difficult to believe that the symmetry between your views and the NEA is quite as f complete as that, but perhaps it is. But this is an interesting new entente forming, if so. So my response will be very brief. Um, I don't have much of an idea of what's going on. And we looked across all the, um, the different uh, demographic factors and uh, had expected uh, income to become more important over time uh, as, uh, as high income parents uh, as ever are able to take advantage of the latest uh, kind of developments for, uh, uh, for their children. And we know how much more money high-income parents are spending on their kids. Uh, the, we know that it's uh, about $10,000 per child per year for the families in the top 20% of the income distribution, uh, spending on uh, lessons and uh, summer camps and computers and private schooling. Um, so we had expected, uh, as um, Sean Reardon has uh, found with uh, some data that income would become more important. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to be the case. Education doesn't seem to become more important, parental education. 
Uh, family structure, family size doesn't seem to have become more important. So uh, we're left with this puzzle, and uh, you invite me to speculate, but I'm I'm really uh, unable to come up with um, a reasonable hypothesis. There was some mention about um, about family uh, and neighborhood. Um, compensation for a single parent family structure that might uh, mute the benefits somewhat as neighborhood institutions are developed that would help out uh, increase in single parent family structure that would lead you to expect perhaps a diminution of the effects over time. So I'm, I'm pretty stuck. <clears throat> Bill, you are quite right to detect some correlation between my views and that of the NEA. <clears throat> which is startling because I believe that when Iraq was removed from the axis of evil, the NRA should have been inserted. You said NRA. In no. Case I agree with no, 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 no. <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> <laughs> NRA refers to, the <laughs> <laughs> refers to the National Recovery Administration. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, w shortly before the Chicago Teachers Union went on, strike against Rahm Emanuel, I went to Chicago to write a sympathetic column about the teachers union, partly for the sheer fun of making life difficult for Rahm Emanuel, but also because I think they have a point, which is given what we know about the limited ability of schools and teachers to make up for the many cultural deficits of the children who are coming to their schools, it is very problematic, it seems to me, as a matter of equity and as a matter of constructive public policy to say that we ought to have merit pay and teacher evaluation and all this measuring how they cope with uh, how they improve the performance of their kids because the, the teachers in uh, Lake Forest north of Chicago and New Trier High School are going to do a lot better with the material they are given when they uh, convene their class on the first day of the school year than are uh, the teachers in the Chicago public schools. Yeah, I, I just wanted to respond quickly to what George Will had said about an earlier issue regarding charter schools. Um, I should also point out that these are very complicated studies. I'm talking about, the, for example, the random assignment uh, study uh, conducted in, in Boston. And what they also did was they, they compared uh, the so-called lottery losers with the lottery winners. That is to say, these are parents who are motivated to get their kids into better schools, okay? And not all of them could get in. So they're lottery winners and lottery losers. And so you're controlling for the self-selection bias by comparing parents who really want to do something to improve their kids' education. And what they found after a period of time was that the lottery losers, with the same characteristics as the lottery winners, did, who, who had to go to the, attend the traditional public schools, did not fare nearly as well as the lottery winners who were in the charter schools. So it just, it's more than just family uh, background here. Yeah, one more question. Yes, <coughs> Bob Woodson, Center for Neighborhood Enterprise. Um, we were talking about correlations between social economic conditions and race. The question is then, what was the condition of the black family doing the time of the Depression when there was an overall unemployment rate of 25% and 40% unemployment in the black community, yet the, the, the marriage rate, from what I understand, was higher than it was in the white community? The incarceration rate, rate in 1954 for black men was 90,000 uh, people which was 10% of the population, that has now escalated to 900,000 today. But my question to you is then what happened? You're the first to take it on. Well, I'll, I'll take it on. <laughs> <laughs> so. In other words, why did the family, why did the black family fall apart during the 10 years of the Depression when there was no political Yeah, you, why didn't the family right. So what we have to do is talk about the cumulative effects of chronic 
racial and economic uh, subordination. And these effects have piled up over time associated with some fundamental changes that are taking place uh, in the economy. I, I remember the black economist uh, uh, Vivian Henderson once saying, you know, it's as if racism having put blacks in an economic place stepped aside to watch changes in technology uh, destroy that place. What he was trying to say was that uh, blacks, males particularly, are becoming sort of redundant over time. And this long-term exposure uh, to joblessness is becoming cumulative and is influencing, has some sort of cumulative effect on the, the patterns that take place within neighborhoods and so on. During the Depression, everybody was, was suffering. But can you imagine what would happen if you had extended joblessness like during the Depression over several decades? And then you could look at the cumulative effect over time on, parent, uh, on families. And that's, that's what I think we're trying to capture. When we, when we talk about the joblessness that, are, that, that we observe in the community, it's just, just not current joblessness, but it's sort of, it's the accumulation of joblessness over time and the, the effects this has on, on individuals, and on, on families, on norms that, that develop in the community, on, on culture patterns that are related to chronic economic and, and racial subordination. It's, it's very, very complex is what I'm trying to say. Well, how, what is the cumulative time? How long does it take before racism destroys the family? Who knows? Who knows? In other words, you don't know. Well, I don't know exactly. I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the answer to that question exactly, but I can tell you one thing. It's more than 10 years. As you see, we have Dr. Peterson weigh in. Oh, OK, so let me uh, just say that how hard it was to put together this issue for the very reason that we're talking about here, it's really hard to figure out what causes these important changes in our society. And uh, it, 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 you know, it's really, it, it's easy to do a little uh, quasi-experimental or experimental study on a small population and maybe detect something large or small that's going on. And those are very valuable studies. I participated in doing them. But trying to put together the big story, what is the big story here? I mean, is this, uh, what I admire about Bill Wilson's work is that he's attempted to answer that question. And very few people have really come to grips with it. And I don't think it's sufficient to say, okay, there's been a lot of cultural changes out there in the society and that sort of produced it. I don't think that gives you much leverage because you don't know whether the culture is changing because some underlying material reality is changing or whether the material reality is changing because the culture is changing. It's all going to get very, very messy uh, very quickly. Uh, and, you know, and, and I, I admire Greg's work because he really does show this change. I found that truly what Bill Galston picked up was really a truly interesting point. The single parent family seems to be a more critical variable today than ever before. So why is that? It's really, and you're right to say I don't know because it's really hard to tease out what's going on there. So I think the point was is that, uh, as Bell Sawhill said, there's some things we know might help and we should at least be thinking about things that might help without knowing whether or not we can actually fully address the problem. Uh, and, and one of them is the kind of issues that Bill works on, is what can we do to enhance male on, uh, employment opportunities, especially young male employment opportunities. We don't think enough about that, and we don't think enough about how can government uh, facilitate uh, marriage. And I actually think there is a bipartisan consensus on both of these, that these goals are something that at least could be embraced. I think there's a chance for policy to move forward in this area uh, if people would really uh, allow themselves to really think about it in a serious way. So I'm looking forward to the conversation continuing into the next panel. Okay, welcome back. The second theme 
that was important in 1965, again, was how do we strengthen families and improve educational outcomes. And we have three people today, 2015, who will help us with that conversation. Uh, first person will be Dr. Sawhill, who is a senior fellow at Brookings Institution. She has spent her career writing books and articles and giving presentations on economic opportunity, most particularly for low and income and disadvantaged children. Uh, I shared with her prior to walking up here in her Purposeful Parenthood uh, article, she mentions a point about children's first teachers, and that's parents. And we know from the previous uh, panel that uh, parents make a difference, and so I look forward to hearing her presentation um, on that subject. We will then turn to uh, Robert Woodson Sr., who is the founder and director of the Center for Neighborhood Enterprise, uh, a former activist in the 70s who decided to move from what we would call a think tank to a do tank. And uh, <laughs> through the center has been working closely with members in urban communities to change the lives of thousands of people. Uh, it's good to see him today. When I was a uh, first year student here in Washington, D.C. at Howard University, he gave a presentation uh, that really shaped and changed how I thought about uh, urban poverty and the role of people uh, to really empower people. So good to see him again. Mm -hmm. We also have Dr. Uh, Galston, who is also a senior fellow at Brookings Institution. He's a former policy advisor to President Clinton. Uh, he has spent a great deal of his work on areas of domestic policy, what roles it plays in families and children. Uh, he's particularly got a focus, again, on making sure we can take those from the bottom up. And because he's had a strong focus on national policy, it will be good to uh, hear his presentation. Uh, the first person to speak will be Dr. Sawhill, and then we'll turn to uh, Mr. Woodson and then to Dr. Galston. And as before, if the, all three want to respond to each other, uh, they have uh, the opportunity to do so, and then we'll turn over to a Q&A. Uh, thank you. I think the first thing I want to do is to congratulate Paul and his team for having put out a terrific uh, issue of Education Next. I read the whole issue and I thought the articles were great and uh, had a lot of good new material in it and a terrific set of contributors, so congratulations. Uh, I'm going to talk about, very briefly, about my piece for the journal. Uh, I was also going to tell a Moynihan story, but I didn't want it to cut into my time. But since everyone else seems to have told a Moynihan story, <laughs> uh, uh, I uh, was sitting, uh, uh, Senator Moynihan and I served on the advisory uh, board of, the, of a little magazine called The Public Interest. And we used to have dinners every year. And one night, I'm sitting next to the senator at dinner, and we're chatting. And uh, he has said several things, and I've asked him to repeat himself not once, but twice. And the second time I asked him to repeat himself, he said, either I'm drunk or you're deaf. <laughs> and he said, it, that's an exact quote. I mean, you know, there was no pussyfooting around. It was either one or the other. I said, Senator, I think it's both. <laughs> I know it was at least one. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, so my uh, first uh, point, if I can get the first slide up here. Why am I not hitting? OK, no, that's got to go backwards. Whoops. OK. Uh, so first point is I think that on this topic, uh, he was right. And I furthermore tend to agree with what um, Senator uh, Alexander said and George Will said in the last se session, which is that these um, educational gaps that we see in our society, which by the way have been widening very, very much by, by class, uh, gaps in educational achievement by class. And uh, everybody then looks at that and says, oh my gosh, the schools have got to do better. And I think we're asking schools to do too much. Obviously, education reform and resources are needed. Uh, I'm not saying they can't do anything in the schools, but they're being asked to do way uh, too much. Uh, they simply can't substitute for what parents and other uh, civic organizations uh, need to be doing. So my view in a nutshell is that family breakdown is a critical issue, as Moynihan said. 
It, it ha has increased child poverty rates, uh, according to my best estimates, uh, by uh, about 25% since 1970. And that is more than any social program that we now have has been able to reduce poverty. So uh, that estimate is in my new book called Generation Unbound that came out this fall. Uh, one of the ways I think about this is imagine that uh, there are a bunch of kids and they're floating down the river and they're at risk of drowning. Uh, and there's a guy by the side of the river who's pulling them out as fast as he can to keep them from drowning. But there's someone else upstream who's throwing them in as fast as uh, the other guy is pulling them out. So our social programs are pulling the kids out, and that's good. We need those programs, but they are fighting a battle that they may not be able to win against this demographic tide of, of changes in family structure and parenting that may uh, overtake the ability of social policy to turn the, to turn the tide. So um, what, what to do? Uh, there are basically uh, three uh, approaches or strategies that normally get discussed here. Uh, the first is, you know, let's restore marriage, let's bring back stable families. And one way to do that, which has already been discussed and is much discussed in the, in the literature, uh, is better job prospects for men, especially young men, and Bill Wilson and others have already talked about that. Uh, the second is, uh, provide even more social supports uh, to single parents. And we need to do some of that as well. Uh, we are doing uh, quite a lot on that front right now. But uh, I submit to you that a second parent can bring income into the household that will almost always be much greater than what any social program can do. I mean, the Earned Income Tax Credit, which is a pretty generous program, which may, at its, um, for, for some families, bring in as much as an extra five or $6,000 a year. Um, but another parent can easily bring uh, in that much income, even if they're in a low-wage job, even if they're not working um, full time. And then the final thing uh, that could be done, and that is a special interest of mine and a focus of my recent book, mm -hmm. is we could reduce uh, unwed births, and there's an easy way to do that. I shouldn't say easy, but a uh, readily available way to do that, and that is to empower women to only have children when they really want to have them, at the time they want to have them, and with the person that they want to be the other parent, uh, and make a commitment to the long-term future of the child. Um, so my view is that um, well, let's see, I, I, I guess this is just a little more detail on uh, all of that, especially on the, the third point here, on wh why I think the third, the third approach uh, has so much uh, to recommend it. Uh, first of all, unwed childbearing is the new norm amongst the youngest generation. You've heard this statistic over and over again today that a little over 40% of all children in America are now born outside of marriage. Well, for the youngest generation, it's over 50% now. So, you know, we're, to a, we're at a tipping point here. Uh, this is uh, going to be tough to turn around. Uh, next point that is much less well known and is something that I figured out in the process of doing research for my book is that 60% of those unwed births uh, to this younger generation, I'm talking about people under 30, uh, were not intended according to the women themselves. Uh, we have this survey that the government runs. It's a very large sample. It's been carefully tested. Uh, of course, the answers may not get at all the nuances of how people feel about having children, but basically women are saying, even after the child is born, when, you know, the sort of cultural instinct would be to say, oh, of course I'm happy and of course I plan this child. They're saying, no, they did not plan to have the child, or at least they didn't plan to have it at that point in their life with that person. Uh, so, a majority, uh, unplanned, unintended. 
Uh, the way I put it in the book is these women are not choosing to become parents when they do. They are drifting into it. Uh, they are having sex because people in their 20s do have sex. They are often living with the father of the child at the time that they get pregnant or have the child. But those relationships are very unstable. By the time the child is age five, uh, the vast majority of the fathers will be gone. Often uh, there will be repartnering of both the mother and the father with additional adults and other children born. Uh, and, you know, there are serious consequences for, for the women themselves, and I've documented this in some other papers I've written recently with a colleague at Brookings. Serious consequences for the woman's educational achievement, uh, drop, dropping out of high school, dropping out of college, uh, not getting to go to college. Uh, serious uh, impacts on ex job experience and earnings, and serious consequences for the stability of their relationships and their prospects of getting married. Uh, just think about the common sense of it. Once you have a baby, uh, how much time do you have to date? And even if you do have time to date and get to know other men, uh, that guy may not want to take on responsibility for some other man's child or children. So there are knock-on consequences from this. Uh, whoops. <laughs> okay. Uh, how could we um, achieve this goal of empowering more women to only have children uh, when they want them? Uh, I think the key here is that we have new forms of birth control, usually called long-acting reversible contraception, or uh, abbreviated as LARCs, not a bird in a meadow, but an IUD or an implant. And they are much more effective than the usual forms of contraception, which are the condom and the pill, which are used overwhelmingly by this group of people in their 20s. And the reason they're so much more effective is because they change the default. Once you've elected to get an IUD, which can last for 10 years, by the way, and these are FDA approved, uh, also approved by the, both the American College of OBGYNs and the American Academy of Pediatrics as the most effective form of contraception for someone who doesn't yet want to have a baby, safe, convenient. Uh, they, they work much better because they are um, not dependent on remembering to take a pill, using, having the discipline to use a condom in the heat of the moment, remembering to get your prescription refilled, not getting to totally unglued when you have side effects from the pill and going off of it for some period of time and getting pregnant accidentally. The literature on this is very clear. But, uh, and these forms of contraception that are so effective and safe are very expensive. They can cost $1,000. And what 24-year-old can afford to lay out $1,000 for this form of birth control? So the good news is the ACA uh, provides these now with no co-pays to the uh, patient. But um, trainers, uh, providers are not trained uh, clinics often don't have them on hand. Many doctors are still skeptical because they remember the old Dal Dalcon Shield incident, in which case uh, the IUD was uh, actually had terrible consequences for people. Um, I also think that the evidence that this would save the government money is overwhelming. Uh, there have been any number of benefit cost studies now that show that even though this costs, let's say, $1,000 up front, think of what one Medicaid birth costs, about $13,000. And then add, you know, various other uh, social uh, services that we provide these women, and, you know, the, the benefit cost ratios are outstanding. In Colorado, where they've experimented with this by doing this in 68 clinics all around the state. They're now saving money in WIC and in Medicaid, as well as reducing um, unplanned pregnancies quite dramatically amongst young women. So uh, we haven't made the case yet to public officials, especially at the state level, about how much this could help. 
Uh, this, by the way, is just a nice chart that uh, the New York Times uh, ran this in September. Uh, when I gave it to them, they couldn't believe it. Uh, they called up other demographers to check me on my facts. Uh, they talked to people at Princeton and elsewhere, and the other demographers said, yeah, that's right. And uh, but you know now young people at Brookings are coming up to me, uh, other young people I know, and say, "Is this really true?" It's true. <laughs> if you're sexually active for five years, and these are averages, you know, but the, the, your, your chances of getting pregnant using condoms with your partner, 63 percent; using the pill, 38 percent; using a long-acting form of contraception, less than four percent after five years. These are cumulative probabilities, but the fact is people are having sex in their 20s for longer than just a few months or one year. So that's the new reality as well. Uh, here's the evidence from a uh, program that has been run in um, St. Louis, Missouri, uh, out of their med school, where they are offering any form of contraception for free and doing good counseling of the women who come in, it's all voluntary, and after counseling, many of them choose a long-acting form of contraception or a LARC, and look at the uh, effects on unintended um, pregnancy rates after one, two, and three years. You can see these are dramatic differences. Well, I think that I'm uh, done, but my bottom line is that some combination of improving education and job opportunities. I don't want to uh, neglect that because uh, that creates the motivation to delay having a child. Some combination of education and job opportunities for both men and women. I don't want to help the men at the expense of the women. Uh, and to the extent it's the relative earnings of the two that matter, we're not going to make a lot of uh, progress there. Um, but to do that and also then empower women to have access uh, to these better forms of contraception uh, at no cost to them. And if we could do that, they would delay having childbearing, having children until they were older, more mature. Think about what Greg Duncan told you, that the age of the mother at the birth of the child is a very important factor in later educational achievement of the child, and it's common sense. I was a mother quite young. I would give my eye teeth to run the clock backwards and wait longer. I would have been a much better mother. Uh, but they are more, and, and even if they don't marry, uh, but they are more likely to marry if they wait, even if they don't marry, they'll be in a better position to raise that child on their own. So uh, thank you for listening, and um, over to, I guess, Bob. Um, I define myself as a radical pragmatist, so I will speak to you from that ideological perspective. Um, I'm, um, uh, I'm a little reluctant to come to events like this because I think uh, I find it a little depressing because from a lot of my learned colleagues, they come across as public policy medical examiners. When we're talking about poor people, all we talk about is uh, a, a diagnosis of pathology. And it is the only field in which people who study the poor are the experts on the poor. And I think both people to the left and right of center have missed the boat when it comes to solutions. People on the right, a left rather, believe that the poor are incapable of making decisions for themselves and therefore it is incumbent upon paid professionals to design remedies that are parachuted into these communities with the expectation that the poor should respond. Um, incidentally, 70% of all dollars that go to people who offer solutions uh, that are fundable, not ones that are effective. And people on the, on, the, on the right conclude that since what the left has been doing with the 20 trillion we've spent so far has not worked, then what we should do is just cut programs and open the doors of the free enterprise system and let meritocracy judge winners and losers. And I think that there is a third way, but both sides are talking about parachuting, whether it's private schools, city year, what have it is parachuting in those communities 
remedies that are designed by, by the non-poor. What we don't do is to apply the principles that operate in our market economy. In our market economy, most of the innovation occurs from the smallest commercial unit. And, I, and that's why the word enterprise is in our name. So what we did is what two scholars rare, rarely do, Rachel and Don Warren, many years ago, went into low-income neighborhoods and they asked questions that professionals seldom ask. Where do you turn to in times of crisis and in trouble? The first of seven institutions that were identified were friends, relatives, local uh, religious organizations, mediating structures within the same cultural and, and, and geographic zip code. The last institution they turned to is a professional service provider. But both sides parachute and provide service to the poor through the institution of last choice, and we wonder why we fail. So what we do at the Center for Enabled Enterprise, we don't do a, a, a failure studies or needs assessment. We go into those low-income communities and we go to the 30% of the households where the, the women are and not raising children that are dropping out of school in jail and drugs to find out what it is, is it that's going on in those households that are not going on in the 70% of the households and they become the experts. We harvest the remedies that have been designed by the people suffering the problem and then we try to insinuate resources in in order to strengthen that and take what works for the few and try it for the many. We also make the mistake of generalizing about the poor. I think there are four categories of poor people. There are those who are just broke. <laughs> <laughs> they, they lack money, but their value system is in place. And they use the welfare system, whether they're a single mom or not, the way it was intended, as an ambulance service, not as a whole transportation system. Category two are the people who, like, uh, who have looked at the disincentives to be independent and decide it's not worth it, and so they stay dependent. The third category is uh, people who are mentally or physically disabled, and we gotta find a way of care for them. But the fourth category are people who are poor because of the chances they take and, and the choices they make. Theirs is a value, theirs is a cultural crisis. But as I read through these papers, I don't see the word culture, I don't see the word virtue, I don't see the word uh, of, of values. I don't see any of those mentioned as causes of people's poverty. And so what all of the groups that I serve around the country, category four is where they specialize. They go into these communities, they try to identify remedies that have been crafted by the people suffering the problem, and then we try to expand on those and, and, and learn from them. And what I've done when I was at the American Enterprise is use the skills and resources of a think tank not to seek the advice and counsel of other PhD scholars, but to take whatever talent I may have and go into the communities and try to find out from the people who have crafted these remedies. Uh, for instance, in the 70s in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, my hometown, a couple took gang members, Sister Falaka Pata, into their homes long story short, is they, their own sick son, one of the members was, was a gang member. She invited his, to bring 16 of his friends home. She cleared out her furniture and they moved in. But they developed the house of Emosia. As a consequence, we have 75 kids living down in five homes purchased by the kids in what they call the house of Emosia. As a consequence, gang deaths went down from 46 to uh, two in one year because she took that influence and had a citywide gang summit. And in 10 years, Ronald Reagan referred to her in his State of the Union address, but not a single researcher from the Marvin Wolf gang at the University of Pennsylvania School of Criminology that received three million a year uh, to come up with remedies, not a single researcher would ride the 20 minutes across town to sit with this woman to find out whether or not this approach was effective. In the 80s, uh, Kimmy Gray, a resident leader of public housing, uh, came together and drove out the drug dealers uh, in her community and in 10 years sent 800 kids to college in 10 years from her public housing development, almost eliminating teen pregnancy in there 
Not a single researcher from either any of the think tanks or the universities ever came across town to sit with this woman to try to find out how she did what she did. Uh, to, and today, we had a, a situation in Philadelphia, uh, Washington where there are 53 murders of young people in a square block, five square block area called Benning Terrace. We armed some community leaders who went in and brought those leaders to my office. We were able to reduce, uh, reduce violence from uh, 53 down to two in a period of 10 years. Again, not a single researcher came in. We've now expanded that, uh, took the principles that we learned and developed what we call a violence-free zone, and we're in 11 schools in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Baylor University finally came in and for five years. They have examined the impact of this community initiative on, compared it, and it's been accepted for academic review. I understand that's important. Um, and it's, it's proven that this intervention works. My point is there is a lot of activity going on in low-income neighborhoods. And I don't understand why it's important to do pathology studies, but not redemption studies. Many of the people that you're talking about, I was raised in a single-parent household because my dad died when I was seven, leaving my mother to raise five children on her own. And so I did not have a nuclear, raised in a nuclear family, and most of those kids will never be raised in a nuclear family. The question and the challenge is, how can we go out and find the other institutions, organizations, coaches, whatever, find out what are, what are alternatives to conventional nuclear families that we can support so that it enables that child to get through those troubled periods the way I did, and Paul Ryan as well. So what we did is I've taken Paul Ryan, who for the past two years, every month, has gone with me into these drug-infested, toxic neighborhoods, and he has witnessed firsthand the powerful, redemptive force of organizations there, and we have uh, a, a mini-series that starts today is, and you can see it's called opportunitylives.com slash um, comeback. It's a whole video essays. There are about seven of them that takes you into these drug-infested, crime-ridden neighborhoods and, and introduces you to individuals that are generating powerful transformations and redemptive activities. And many of the people who are or in these ministries and in these programs are marrying people by the hundreds that they meet in these programs. But again, I don't see anyone rushing in from our great universities or our think tanks offering to do studies of redemption. Where are the redemption studies? Uh, we don't have a moderator up here, and maybe uh, Bill has to uh, yeah, speak. No, I was just looking at Bill Wilson trying to get in, and yeah, wondering what we're no, supposed Bill to do. Yeah, Bill has to speak yeah, first before so anybody too. questions. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, you know, let my let me add my voice of congratulations to Bill uh, for this terrific issue of education next. Uh, I can well believe that it was difficult to put together uh, given the nature of the subject. Uh, I just want to do a couple of things very quickly. First, by way of introduction, uh, there's a kind of historical paradox of irony, call it what you will. When I was a graduate school, uh, graduate student and a young professor, the you know, the conventional wisdom about cultural change went something like this. There had been an outburst of, you know, anarchism and licentiousness, rejection of, you know, social and institutional norms on the part of the educated and the over-educated. And that there was a danger that, you know, there was a danger that this would become this would become normative for the entire society, but fortunately, the sturdy virtue of the middle classes and the working classes would resist 
you know, the cultural degradation of the, of, of the overeducated young people. Well, fast forward to today, and when it comes to marriage and family structure, it's a tale of two cities, except it's flipped on its head. You know, people who are educated are typically bound together in what might be called neo-traditional marriages. There's a portion of American society where marriage is alive and well, and it's in the upper middle classes, where there's, you know, where there's hardly any out-of-wedlock birth, where there's hardly any divorce, you know, where the norms of family integrity are as robust as they were when I was a boy in the 1950s. The problem has come at the other end of the income spectrum. And we need to think about, A, why that is, and B, what it is, talk about redemption studies, what it is that we can learn from those areas of society where marriage is strong and central. Uh, number two, what do we you know, what do we now know based on the research done by many of the people who wrote for Education Next, you know, some of whom have not yet fled Washington and are still in the room? Uh, and I would summarize it in three points. Number one, we can say with considerable confidence that there are significant effects of family structure independent of income. Twenty years ago, I think there was still a quarrel as to whether income washed out the effects of family structure. I think we can say with some confidence that, that is not the case now. Uh, second, uh, and Greg's study, about which we had a colloquy, uh, I think has demonstrated this, those effects have only grown over time. And Bell Sawhill came up with an interesting hypothesis as to why that might be true, that she might be interested in sharing with us at some point. And number three, and I really want to underscore this point, these developments have been even worse for boys than for girls. The results are not gender neutral. When Sarah McClanahan and Sandy Jenks talk, I listen. And here's what they have to say, in part, in their terrific article. Growing up with only one biological parent reduces a child's chances of graduating from high school by about 40%. Skip forward a little bit. Most studies find larger effects on boys than on girls. And they go on, based on this synthesis of 45 quasi-experimental studies, to state what appears to them to be the research-based reason why. Uh, a father's absence increases antisocial behavior, such as aggression, rule-breaking, delinquency, and illegal drug use. Thus, it appears that a father's absence lowers children's educational attainment not by low altering their scores on cognitive tests, but by disrupting their social and emotional adjustment and reducing their ability or willingness to exercise self-control. The effects of growing up, growing up without both parents on aggression, rule breaking, and delinquency are larger for boys than for girls. Now, if you accept that research finding, that has very important implications. Uh, and it suggests that the play to the, and here now I'm going to try to move from diagnosis to prescription. It suggests that we really need a crash program in this country. Accepting, for a moment, Bob Woodson's point that reversing this change in family structure is going to be very difficult. It's going to be taking, it's going to take a very long time if it can be done. And I'm, you know, I'm still somewhat optimistic on that point, but nobody's going to wave a wand and do it. How can we think about a crash program for boys? This is sort of the flip side of, of, of Val Sawhill's presentation about girls. And I would make, I would make 
the following points. Number one, we have to pay much more attention than we do to this basic metric of graduation from high school. And we ought to make that one of our key indicators. Here is a statistic that I got from the paper that Bill Wilson collaborated on. And I nearly fell out of my seat. OK? Take a look. Take a look at men with less than a high school diploma. As we speak, 37% of African American young men ages 20 to 24 without a high school diploma are in prison. 37%. Flip to the next page. Children under 18 with a parent in prison or jail. Uh, in 1980, uh, for African American young men, it was less than 3%. Today, it's 11%. One out of nine children in that community wake up every morning knowing that they have a parent in jail. So there is a lot of good that can be done by focusing on graduation rates and asking ourselves rigorously and practically, what the heck can we do to counteract this, you know, what is still, despite some recent improvements, an epidemic of high school dropouts? Uh, because if you drop out of high school in this economy, you are dead. You're dead. It's a, you know, it's, it, it is an almost irretrievable catastrophe. Okay? I know there are going to be glorious counterexamples, but as a statistical generation, I'm sure of that. Number two, focus on incarceration. Those numbers that I just read from Bill Wilson's paper are a disaster. And there is a bipartisan consensus forming that we have gone from one extreme to the other in about two generations, you know, from under-incarceration to rampant over-incarceration. This is connected with our drug laws and a lot of other things. Because if you have been sent to prison or jail in today's job market, it is going to be very, very difficult for you to get a job afterwards. And if you can't get a job afterwards, then you are not going to be regarded as marriageable by most young women. The research, I think, sustains the proposition that the threshold question for young men, young women, in considering the prospect of marriage is whether a young man has a stable attachment to the job market. If you can't even get a job because you have a black market mark on your record, well, what is that going to do for marriage and family formation? Nothing good, I can promise you. Uh, third, uh, there should be a much more aggressive effort to connect young men to the world of work. We spend so much time on emphasizing four-year college completion. If you look at co other countries around the world, as a number of these papers indicate, they do so much better at preparing young people, particularly young men, but also young women, for these mid-skill jobs. Uh, there are all sorts of wonderful examples of career academies uh, where, people are, where people are trained uh, for professions that are not only extremely useful to society, but very well compensated. You know, the average electrician makes a lot more per hour than the average office worker. Ever tried to get an electrician on short notice? Uh, or a plumber. There you go, a plumber. Fourth and, fourth and finally, for all sorts of economic reasons uh, that we don't have time to talk about, there has been downward pressure on wages for less skilled people in our society, and that's a long-standing trend. Uh, and I happen, I happen to believe 
that despite some design flaws, the idea of a dramatically expanded earned income tax credit available to young single people, including young single men, uh, would have the effect of fortifying their connection to the labor market once it's, once it's established, and assuming that there's no marriage penalty uh, in the uh, EITC, making them much more attractive as marriage partners. So if we can do those four things, you know, a crash program for high school graduation, some serious attention to incarceration policy, uh, rethinking how schooling can connect young people, especially young men, to the world of work, and, and focusing even more on how public policy can make work pay, I think we could begin to make a dent in this problem. And this is not an argument against civil society-based solutions. It is intended to be a complementary stream of policy. last panel, we will give you an opportunity to respond to each other, and then we'll turn it over to the audience for a QA. and a I guess, Bill, when you say it is not an argument against civil society, um, but we, are, we seem to be great in articulating the what, but you don't describe the how or who is to do it. Um, most of the young uh, people that I know in these communities that are suffering those problems, they have a value crisis. They, they need to re be remoralized. They, they, and, and the people that are able to reach them and make them uh, uh, prepared for, for the workforce are able to bring about transformation of their attitudes and values and beliefs. But there is not a, I think, the resources do not flow to untutored deliverers of service. What funders both left and right do support are remedies that are designed by themselves or people like them that are parachuted in and usually it's a therapeutic approach or, or some kind of other social intervention. A lot of times there are programs designed by the sons and daughters of the wealthy uh, uh, who then uh, a parachute, and then there is a bias against supporting civil, civic institutions that are indigenous to the communities. There is a bias towards scholars even coming, Bill, to examine the, imp the, the impact that they're having. Most, most your scholars don't even show up because there is a bias against believing that there's anything in Nazareth worth uh, saving. And so that's the problem that we face, is why don't some of you ever come to those communities that are suffering the problem where there are solutions being crafted by civic institutions there? Why aren't they the subject of evaluation and study? That's a question. Well, perhaps Bill Wilson has an answer. <laughs> okay. We have a response in the back, Dr. Wilson. We definitely have a response to that because I'm sitting there listening to Woodson pontificate about uh, scholars who are engaged in pathological studies and not doing redemption studies. And, you know, let me ask you, okay, uh, have you read uh, Catherine Eden's book, Promises I Can Keep? No, I haven't, Bill. Uh, okay, have you read Samson's no, book? No, wait, 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 wait. Okay, okay, wait, wait. No, I haven't read any. Okay. Let's assume that, all right, all right. Let's assume that I haven't read okay. any of those let's books. Let's assume, and, and I have to add one more thing. Please beg with me, uh, bear with me. I assume you haven't read my book, Successful Adolescents in High-Risk Areas, as well. Absolutely okay. not. Okay, all right. So, <laughs> you know, you, you say scholars are not involved in redemption studies. I think you need to be less... Uh, categorical. That's all I'm saying. Okay, because there are scholars. That, take Samson's book, for example. The very institutions that you're talking about, he he went in and 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 talked to people, and they talked about the success of their programs in Chicago, and and highlighted. In fact, there was an article in the New York Times, I believe, 
on, 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 on some of these really successful neighborhood programs uh, that, that he talks Bill, about. Bill, I'm not talking about one or two scholars. Doing, oh, I'm wait saying a in general, I, I, scholars do not, conservative scholars that, uh, I sit on these panels, which I very seldom do, but I don't hear, I, I, re, I read a little bit, you know, once in a while I read a book, um, but I don't, I don't hear in general, when I go to conferences or I read the papers, uh, for instance, for this conference, I didn't see any example in those papers of what I'm talking about. And I've got three more conferences that are coming up by other think tanks. None of those, uh, of those compilation of papers have I seen any discussion of capacity. That's my point. Well, that's why it's it good to have to you. It isn't to say it doesn't exist that's, anywhere. Sure, okay. That's why it's good to have you on the panel, by the way, because you're, you're bringing in these insights. But I just don't want you to be be too categorical in dismissing scholars uh, who, because there are a number of us, including myself, who are looking at some of the things that you're talking about, okay? Would you, would you agree with me that that is not the general uh, uh, position of most scholars? Uh, I would say maybe, uh, I wouldn't say, okay, most scholars. Who studies poverty? Most scholars Let's who study poverty do not. Those who discuss. Right. What they're trying to do is explain the problems that plague a lot of these neighborhoods. And only recently, and this is where I would agree with you, have there been a proliferation of studies looking at some of the redemption things that you're talking about. But they're out there and they're growing. And I mentioned a few of them, including my own work, by the way, Successful Adolescents in High-Risk Areas. I'll send you an email on the book talking about the very things that you're talking about, why some of these kids are making it against overwhelming odds. And it's good to sort of look at them to get a better understanding of how people cope with problems that plague these neighborhoods. Well, I hope in every time you do a presentation that you inform your peers instruct them that that's what they need to be doing. Well, uh, let me say that that's why it's good to have you on the panel to remind us to do th uh, uh, some of these things. I have a, well, I don't want to. You have a question? For uh, yeah, I have a follow-up sure. question. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, you say, you know, these kids have developed a value crisis. You know, have you thought about how this value crisis developed? Yeah, I, know, I, have, I have thought about it, and I have written about it as well. Okay. Do you want to share some yeah, thoughts I mean, with us? Yeah, I mean, some of them grow up in homes where they are taught by their mothers and fathers who are drug addicts. They live in an environment that, that, that teaches them that being lawless or irresponsible is a norm. Yeah, that's how they do. Yeah, but how did these things develop? That's the point. For me, I don't care how they develop. What I'm concerned about is how do we rechange and reform it. And so when I deal well, with gang women, when I deal with 20 gang members who are shooting each other and we come in and we connect with those kids and I bring them into my office and into my home, I don't care how they got that way, but all we do is through our own actions help redirect and change them. And I've seen dramatic transformations of kids who were predators and now they're ambassadors of peace and we've taken that principle and spread it. So I don't have to know the cause of something to know what conditions must exist in order to redirect that person. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, no doubt your programs have been successful. I don't, I don't challenge it. I assume you get support from uh, foundations who ask for evaluation of these programs. Yes, and we give them that response. Yeah. Now, some of them want evaluations just based on a couple of years. They don't wait for the cumulative success of these programs over time. Have you faced that problem? Uh, no, not really, but because we have data over, over a long period of time with many of our programs, for instance, uh, have been in existence for 20 years. And so we know the individuals, but we haven't had the resources to bring in the right people to do those kind of studies. It's very interesting that we get more outcomes from investigative reporters who come in as critics and then leave as advocates. I wish the researchers were as diligent as these reporters in coming in and asking us about what, uh, what 
proof that we have that our programs work? Well, this, be, this could be an opportunity for right. you to okay. after this to <laughs> okay. dialogue. And no, I just want him to just share with us the cumulative effects of his programs, the long-term effects. That would be very, very uh, useful information to receive. I'd like to know if the two professors, well, actually two senior fellows from Bookings like that. I wanted to move to a slightly different topic here. Uh, lots of people today have talked about Moynihan's focus on the scissors effect. And um, I think that that's very interesting and it raises this whole question that was talked about on the last panel about uh, what is cause and what is effect here? What's the chicken and what's the egg? And I think for myself, uh, often we find that there's an uh, initial change in the economy that then changes the culture and then the culture has further feedback effects on economic outcomes and, and so forth and so it's very hard to untangle all of that and we should all be humble about that and I personally think both economics and culture matter. Uh, that said I want to point out uh, where this scissors metaphor is being used in a new book that some of you may be interested in. Uh, and that is the book that Bob Putnam has just written and which will be out, I think, next week. It's out. Okay. Uh, I happen to have read it. I think it's terrific. And he talks about scissors as well. And the scissors he talks about is that in so many different domains right now in American life, the gaps between the rich and the poor or, the, or poor kids and rich kids are widening. Not, we, we all talk, have all talked about income inequality, and obviously there's a widening gap in incomes. But there's also a widening gap in family structure, and Bill talked about that. There is also a widening gap in parenting styles, uh, and the amount of time. I mean, these well-educated mothers, they are working very hard, but they are actually spending more time with their kids I'm talking about actual measurement of allocation of time in real child, ch ch child interaction uh, than their less educated counterparts. Uh, there, uh, there are all many other dimensions of the gap in parenting styles, but it's getting wider. There's a widening gap in segregation by class in America. So that those neighborhood conditions that Bill talks about. Right, that's what I mean by class. Right. He sometimes uses education rather than income, but you could use either one. Uh, and I, I, I think this is a very interesting um, and disturbing phenomenon because I think all of these scissors suggest we are becoming not just divided by income, but by divided by so many other important um, metrics of the ability to uh, be uh, part of the main street. And it looks like I've Wait, catalyzed to Paul to want to say something about this, or maybe it's about you something else. want to Dr. Gauss go first and then to you, Dr. Peterson? Okay. Well, you know, I, you know, I, I've been working for nearly 30 years, off and on, on this complex nexus between culture and values on the one hand and economics and economic opportunity on the other. Uh, and I don't claim to understand it in all of its complexity, uh, but I am on the fundamentals exactly where I was 30 years ago. They both matter. Neither can be reduced to the other. And there's a complicated two-way causality between them. Uh, and I also agree with Bob Woodson, namely that, that the, nature, the nature of the cure isn't necessarily the same as the nature of the cause. Exactly. Uh, but still, it helps to think through that causal question because it's not, it, it's not, always, it's not always obvious. So let me, you know, I made a lot of, I made some proposals in the economic realm, but let me just mention a couple of points about culture and values in, in this area. Number one, you know, kudos to Bell Sawhill, who almost 20 years ago, uh, you know, pioneered. Well, well, tell people how old I am. You know, <laughs> well, no, I'm kidding. Uh, almost, I, I was just 
riffing through a number of possible responses, and I decided to suppress all of them. You'll be happy to hear. Uh, the, you know, who, you know, who took the lead in establishing an organization then known as the National Campaign to Prevent Teen Pregnancy, and one of the basic pillars of that campaign was that we needed to change the culture. We needed to change the conversation. We needed to change the discourse that talking about individual programs would not be enough if that were disconnected from a broader cultural conversation. I believe that exactly the same thing is true of marriage and family structure, which is why, advertisement for myself, you know, the lead article in this month's Washington Monthly is you know, is a statement of what is what we hope will become a marriage opportunity movement, bringing together liberals and conservatives, gays and straights, uh, to talk in a common language about the importance of marriage and of creating access to it and opportunity to enter to enter into it and incentives to enter into it. Uh, secondly. On the issue of moralization and remoralization and moral training, you're about to hear a profession of faith. The core institution for moral instruction in this society and in any society is the family. If the family is not performing that function, we will always be playing catch up. I am deeply skeptical that any government program or any civil, institu civil society institution can ever be a complete substitute for functioning family structures. And, you know, and it is one thing to have a divorce mm. or the death of a father. It is a different thing to grow up never knowing your father. And I think there's a substantial amount of evidence that that you know, that that leads to not only the sorts of things that Jenks and McClanahan were talking about, but a hole in the heart that leads to all sorts of behaviors. I, you know, I believe this with all my heart. And that's why I am very, very reluctant to cede the marriage terrain because I think it is a catastrophe for young men. You know, Dr. Peterson, then we'll come back. Well, all these are very moving observations uh, and a fitting uh, uh, second panel to sort of reflect on, on the meaning of all that we've been talking about. Um, I, uh, I, I do think that one of this, the, the growing gap phenomenon that people have been identifying, not enough attention has been given to the fact that we have this substantial division of our society between children being raised in dual parent and single parent families. And I know it's not easy to figure out what the causes are, but I think that most of the literature that's been talking about the gap has been ignoring one of the largest factors that is contributing to this growing gap, this, this separation of, of children being raised into two different kinds of families. One family has all those resources that income and education and two parents <clears throat> can bring to the table. And it's not easy to raise children <clears throat> even if you have two parents. It's hard for me to imagine how you raise uh, children when you have just one parent who has to be the breadwinner as well. So uh, I, I think that's really the important, the important message that we need to convey to the larger discourse is that when you talk about the growing gap in society, don't forget the family. You know, as Bill says, the family is really at the core. Neighborhood institutions are important, civil institutions are support, all important, and they can be important insofar as they can help support the family, but the family really is the central institution. Now, having said all those nice positive things, I want to be a little bit more critical and say, Bill, you have a fascinating proposal out there on the table. It's really quite a new proposal. It's all, almost persuasive, especially when you present it. But I'm still wondering, are, are really babies unwanted? Um, the, when I read the stories of what life is like for young women, 
babies are sometimes very important to them, even if they are not married. And uh, Kathy Egan has a wonderful book on this topic. I was hoping she would contribute an essay to the collection so that would be brought to the table as well. So I'm not as convinced um, as you are that actually we have a technological solution. What's really great about your proposal is it's a technological solution to a social problem. And I, and I just wonder about that. So can you reflect on that a bit? Absolutely, and uh, thank you for questioning that. I think it's the, it's the right question, and I've thought about it quite a lot. Uh, there's no question that um, when we talk about unintended pregnancies or births, it's a spectrum. It's not a zero, one thing. Um, and there are different amounts of intentionality that go into uh, getting pregnant and having a child. The reason I use the word drifting so much in my book is because I think it reflects the kind of um, ambivalence that many women feel. And uh, to paraphrase Bob, we shouldn't say all women are alike any more than all poor are alike. There are That's some right. women who end up getting pregnant and have a baby who are very depressed about it, really it's all wrong for them, it throws their life in a cocked hat. I mean, you know, it's a really bad situation, and there are others where, well, maybe they didn't quite intend it, but it turns out to be fine. And most people, um, once a baby is born, uh, are going to love that child and do the right thing by that child. So, you know, there's, there are many, many flowers, type, type, varieties of this out there. Also, no question that uh, if you don't see your prospects as being very bright, um, you are a female high school dropout, and you might have dropped out because you got pregnant with your mm -hmm, mm -hmm. boyfriend in high school. And there's a lot of that, by the way. And by the way, a lot of dropping out of community college because of unintended pregnancies. And you know, we could get into a whole discussion about uh, abortion, which I, you know, that would be a very toxic and, and long conversation, but um, there is a very strong feeling, especially in many low-income communities, uh, that abortion is absolutely morally wrong. And so once you get accidentally pregnant, you're going to have this baby. It's also, you don't see a lot of uh, married couples around you, and so it's become normative to raise the child on your own, and it may indeed provide some fulfillment and sense of purpose in your life, as Kathy Eden argues. One of the things I'd say, though, Kathy Eden's studies are uh, ethnographic, qualitative studies of, a, of very low-income communities. This phenomenon that we're talking about is not just something that affects the poor. I mean, you're right that the college-educated are escaping from unwed pregnancy and escaping to a large extent from unintended pregnancies and births. But they were only 30% of the population. Right, right, right. The other 70% is engaged in everything that I've talked about. And uh, overall, in American society right now, over half of pregnancies are unintended, according to the women's own reports. Uh, and again, you know, that's a spectrum. So I've, I've emphasized at the end that you know, a sense of opportunity, of hope about the future, does matter. Uh, in terms of you know, possibly choosing or at least accepting an early birth. But um, there, the rates of unintended births amongst low-income women and women of color are four or five times as high as they are amongst better off and majority women. So something's amiss here. Uh, why is that happening? and what could be done about it? Uh, it would be interesting to... Um, you know, you could say, well, you don't believe that they're unintended, even though that's what they're telling the people, but, you know, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't deal with, it, with people who, who, who don't want to believe the data. I mean, you know, as Moynihan used to say, right, we are all in t uh, in t uh, entitled to our own opinions, but not to our own facts. Let me just uh, offer, it um, be interesting to study um, 
how kids were raised in expensive boarding schools without their parents there every day, how they fare. So the other point is, to a lot of inner city kids, their peer group, sometimes a gang, is more important to them than their families. And we can ignore that, we can think, and so the challenge is how do we take that relationship and transform it so it serves to act as a parent surrogate. If you were to ask me whether I had a choice of my six friends that I grew up since childhood or my family, I would choose them. And that's why perhaps I can identify with gangs because I, those peer relationships, it's not my, my dad or my mom could get me to a party on time or get me through my neighborhood safely to school every day. But my peer group enables me a level of mobility that my parents do not. And these are realities of inner city life that people outside don't understand. So, so I think it's important to, yes, talk about families, but never at the expense of these other forms of surrogate families that enables the child to get through that very troubled period to adult life. Any other questions from the audience? No questions? Well, first of all, I'd like to thank our three panelists again for talking to us about strengthening families and the improving education. Again, I think that uh, Patrick Moynihan again would be proud to have this discussion taking place. Two big takeaways for me. Number one, we know that 50 years later, family still matters. And from listening to today's conversation, I understand that family has a very ubiquitous need across space and time. Second, education still matters. And we have to educate the kids we have, not the ones we want, including their families. And so in the spirit of ideas defining the free society, thank you for coming, thank you for our sponsors, and thank you for being here.